He puts his IR laser on the car, shine, shines it in the car, and then I think he flipped on his visible laser, hit him with the visible laser. It's kind of like a get the hell, yeah. get the hell out of there. It's kind of a universal get the inter away. interpreter, right? Yeah. The guy didn't go anywhere, and so Dave escalated and he, you know, flipped his flipped his safety off and he fired two warning shots over the hood, and the guy didn't move. He stayed there. Our 50 cal belts had like armor piercing incendiary tracer, Rafis, you know, and several other rounds, you know, on there. It was like kind of like a laser light show hitting this hitting this car. I mean, it was just blowing up all over the place. Then he turned away turned away from us and uh, I put a couple more, you know, into his uh, in his back windshield and it killed him and he crashed into a wall. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He served 13 years in the United States Navy, most of which as a Navy SEAL. He conducted five deployments, three of which were at SEAL Team 3. He is the owner of Bottle Breacher, uh, which is a kick-ass company that makes uh, a host of products, but primarily are known for the bottle openers made out of 50 caliber uh, shells, which we'll talk about. He's also a brand ambassador for Sig Sauer Firearms. He has a NASCAR driver's name and his Wyatt Earp stunt double. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Eli Crane. Thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, your name does sound like an NASCAR driver to me, or maybe even like a, a movie star. Like it, it has that ring to it. I like that, and I've yeah. never I've never heard that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, steal it from you. Yeah, the uh, Rubbin's racing fucking uh, what movie is that? Days of Thunder. That's right. Yeah, Cole Trickle. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re revolutionizing. American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house, and they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now, and I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us, and so thank you to you guys. I'd like to take a second to uh, shout out our newest sponsor, which is Project Warpath. This is a Navy SEAL-owned company uh, that provides apparel with a pretty edgy uh, feel, and uh, it's a good friend of mine that, uh, that runs it out of California, uh, and just an, overall a great outfit. Um, they've got a, a whole line of different shirts, uh, one of which uh, is, is arguably, arguably my favorite, which is Epstein Didn't Kill Himself. wonder where that one came from. And, uh, but yeah, there's Hillary Clinton Killed My Friends. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, pretty edgy and cool patriotic sayings on T-shirts with uh, with good design, good high quality, uh, and it's one that uh, that I'm actually wearing right now. So uh, I appreciate uh, them sponsoring the show again. That's Project Warpath. Uh, you can get all their stuff online, and uh, and you know the shipping and customer service is top notch, quality product, and uh, you're supporting a veteran owned business. So shout out to Project Warpath. Go check their uh, stuff out. I'd also like to say thank you to our other sponsor, Resilience Premium CBD. Resilience is excited to offer all Mic Drop listeners a 20% off discount on all products for two weeks from when this podcast is live using the discount code Mic Drop at checkout. That's two words, Mic Drop at checkout. I'd also like to say that Resilience is a great company uh, that works in conjunction with Trico CBD. And all military veterans and first responders receive 35% off. Yes, that's 35% off for all military veterans and first responders. And that's uh, through the military and first responders program. You just have to sign up at resiliencebd.com slash military first responders discount. 
Uh, in terms of about resilience, generally speaking, it's a premium CBD that I use. Again, it works in conjunction with the Tricos brand for the everyday athlete. Uh, that's www.resiliencecbd.com. And Resilience was uh, really born with the founders who uh, are military veterans as well, personally experienced the effects uh, and impact that CBD had on their own mental and physical obstacles. Their focus was sharper, mental stress was calmed, fitness stamina increased, and their bodies felt less pain, inflammation after super intense workouts. Uh, a lot of times most people and, and people are able to either wean and off entirely or significantly reduce pain management, ther uh, pain management therapy. This is a shared vision among the founders that this uh, incredible supplement had not only changed their lives, but had the power to provide unbelievable benefits to family, friends, athletes, fellow veterans, and ultimately the entire fitness community. So big shout out to Resilience for their product as well as the Trico stuff. Uh, we sure appreciate their support. Um, what was your favorite meal growing up? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, like probably, probably, probably lasagna. Yeah? Probably lasagna. Mom yeah. threw down lasagna in the kitchen? Yeah, she would. Is she Italian? No, she's not. She's Just, Swedish. No shit. Yeah. Fucking A. Uh, what's your best memory about growing up? Oh man, that's a good one. Um, probably just playing outside, you know, playing, you know, cowboys and Indians army. Like we had, we lived in one of those, uh, you know, back when, uh, life was, I think a little bit better. Simpler. You could, you could go out and like mom would be like, Hey, come back at yeah. when it's dark for dinner. And we just roam the neighborhood, ride all, ride all our bikes all over the city. And, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, it. Uh, I know we were talking just a minute ago. We, we both have kids that are, <coughs> I know at least for mine, like they've grown up drastically different than, than the way I did, you know, and, and you know, in, in some ways probably better, but in some ways uh, I'm sure I'm a little biased because that's how I grew up, but I, I wish that they had experienced some of those things that, uh, that, that we did growing up riding by. Man, fuck, we rode our bikes everywhere, you know, like that was and miles and miles away from home at, at like when I was in third grade, you know, right. Like, I mean, shit that I think now I'm like, there's no fucking way I would let you do what I did. And I, I don't know why it's so different now, but, right. but God damn, it sure is. Uh, what was your first gun? My dad bought me a, a Ruger 10 22. That was my first real gun. I had yeah. some BB guns before that, but the Ruger 10 22 kind of like uh, so, started it. Yeah. All. Yeah. Did you uh, hunt with it at all or just my, I did, yeah. you know, and, um, unfortunately I didn't get a hunt a lot cause my, my dad, um, was in a hunting accident when he was a young man, his brother ended up accidentally shooting him on a hunt. Oh no shit. And so surprise, surprise, he wasn't too fired up about hunting anymore yeah. after that. And so I didn't get to do a ton of hunting, but we would do, like, we would go hunt rabbits and ducks and, you know, small game stuff like that yeah. and it wasn't until the seal teams when i became a sniper that we would start you know going on trips and that was a part of it and yeah. i just kind of fell in love with it yeah i, I definitely want to get further into sniper school uh later on here and, and talk about some of the the parallels between that and, and the regular seal teams but um what was your uh, your first car Oh, dude, it was, I think it was a 91 Chevy Corsica. Oh, and shit. It was, <laughs> it was awesome because, uh, now, now that you're older, you like, you can, you know, divulge some of this stuff, but I remember, you know, I don't know how the car still ran because there was like, we would jump it all the time. Yeah. And my dad had this like private mechanic that he would take the car to. And guys were like, the what guy the was fuck? like, there's a guy like, Val, I don't know what your kids are doing to this car, man, but <laughs> something is up with, you know, this car's getting hammered. And you'd yeah. be like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, nothing. And then <laughs> after school, the next day, we'd be driving down the back roads in Yuma, Arizona. And we, we you know, we would like sing the, you know, uh, Dukes of Hazard song, all four, <laughs> like four of us dudes in the car. And they'd be like, dun, 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 dun. And you'd fly and hit it and be like, boom and it'd be like oh my god that was awesome let's do it again <laughs> jesus christ what were you jumping like yeah just, just like mounds? yeah dirt mounds and whatnot yeah. but it's yeah, fucking priceless. but it just goes to show you know what an idiot <laughs> i i was and i think some of that still exists in me oh yeah i mean that fuck i'm right there with you uh car yeah cars have absolutely turned into kind of my my favorite pastime but um what's what if there's one thing that you could you could kind of reduce out of 
the Navy in terms of what you miss most about it, what would that be? 100% the guys. Yeah, right there yeah. with you. Uh, what is your morning routine when you're not traveling normal day at home? Um, the first thing I do is I usually get up and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of check the news to see what's going on in the day. And that's just as I'm getting ready real quick. And then I'll head to the gym. Um, I'll do weights. And then a couple times a week after lifting, I'll go and do some cardio, maybe like my back, my back and my knees and my hips are pretty screwed up. So I can't like, you know, run for long periods, but I'll do like some, you know, uh, sprints and whatnot. And then, then I'll usually come, come home or go straight to work, work at bottle breacher for a little while. Um, and then I always try and be home around dinner time so yeah. I can hang out with my girls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of eating habits, what have you, do you, are you a faster until a certain time or do you? I am. Yeah. I usually, usually fast till around at least noon. Yeah. Sometimes if I'm feeling good, I'll push a little bit, but, um, yeah, I, I find that that tends to work pretty good for me. Yeah. Uh, do you subscribe to any particular type of eating habits when, uh, when you do eat, like you only eat certain things or, or do you just kind of do whatever? You know, I, I think the only things that I'm really looking, you know, to, to avoid are probably, uh, you know, the carbs, breads, but I, I'll still, shit. I'll still, yeah, I'll still eat them. But, um, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna skip something, it'll, it'll be that. Yeah. But I, when I'm eating, I try to enjoy my yeah. food. Yeah. No, fucking a. Uh, so I know you meant, you mentioned, uh, Yuma, Arizona. I'm assuming that's where you grew up. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, tell me about your childhood a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, growing up in Yuma, you know, for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of <laughs> going, it's the kind of like, uh, it's kind of like an Iraqi town here in uh, the United States only you have English street signs and it's just really hot out in the middle of the deserts. So it's usually one of the hottest places in the country. So that really helped me, you know, later on in life going overseas, I was really used to it yeah. where a lot of guys were not. And, uh, but it's, it's a border town. So, you know, that, you know, that's kind of cool in a way. Um, you know, you just get, you know, you get to experience definitely a different culture. You know, you, you are the minority if you're a white guy in Yuba, Arizona. And so that was kind of cool. Um, you know, we had a lot of Mormons there. Really? Yeah. You know, and you know, it, it, know. it was just cool. It was just cool. Just being able to learn how to, uh, you know, befriend everybody and uh you know kind of see the best in everybody but um another cool thing about yuma is like if you like off-roading the uh we have the sand dunes there that like star wars was filmed in like right outside of yuma yeah and so a lot of guys like to off-road and stuff like that but um i still give my dad a hard time like for moving our family to yuma like hey yeah. what were you thinking man so it wasn't like he's a military guy no no he was a he was a pharmacist that he went to school in iowa and then he moved out west and, you know, just following, you know, where the good jobs were. And, and at the time, you know, nobody wanted to live in Yuma. So he's like, <laughs> for good goddamn hey, reason. Hey, I'll take that. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, I think the good thing about, you know, and I, I don't want to bash on Yuma too much. I mean, there's some great things about it. But, you know, I think one of the good things about, you know, growing up in Yuma for me was that, um, you know, everywhere in life after that was kind of, I felt like was kind of gravy. Yeah. And then when we were living in a trailer in Fallujah and guys were complaining about this place sucks, it's so hot. I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm home, <laughs> you know? So I grew up with this shit. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, was your dad from Iowa or did you just, yeah, go? No him, shit. And, him and my mom both. Really? Uh, yeah. Fuck, I'm from Iowa. That's wild. Oh, what? no kid. Yeah, yeah. They grew up in a small, small town called Pleasantville. And I loved, I, right where that's I loved going and like, I only got to go a couple times as a kid, but I was blown away because my cousins, like they could just like jump on a four wheeler or yeah. grab their 22 and go on the backyard and go hunting where yeah. I was from a, you know, little suburb in Yuma there, there was none of that. Yeah. So I was, I was infatuated with that kind of farm lifestyle. And, yeah. um, but I understand, you know, a lot of people get tired of that weather and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, it's like with anything, I think, you know, there's ha just like with you and you, you know, you, you kind of love hate type of thing is that, you know, it's what you grew up with. So there's some nostalgia there that, that you like. There's also 
some elements where the grass is always fucking greener, you know, no matter what, like, you right. know, if I, if I, growing up in Iowa had gone to Yuma, I'm sure there's things that have been like, fuck, that's awesome. You get, you know, whatever, right. but it doesn't get cold here, you know, like, cause in Iowa, yeah, it gets fucking ri- ridiculously cold. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is, it was a great place to grow up. No, no two ways about it. Uh, sibling wise, did you have a big family or was it just you or two brothers, two brothers, older, uh, older and younger? Yeah. Yeah. So the middle kid, how, uh, how was growing up with them relationship wise? Do you guys get along all right or typical shit? Yeah. Um, uh, we got along pretty well. Um, you know, just the, I, I would say the typical inner sibling squabbles and whatnot. My older brother was kind of like having a second mom. Like he, <laughs> you know, he, clam- you know, he was always watching me and i think for good reason yeah you know i wonder sometimes where i'd be if i had an older brother like that i'd be dead <laughs> but yeah he he kept me out of a lot of trouble and uh he grew up and he's a great dude now he's a chemist out in colorado and my little brother who i was actually probably closer to growing up um he you know probably one of the smartest men i know and he uh he got accepted into all three naval or all three military academies chose the naval academy and that was really cool for me to watch because I think up until that point, I'd never seen somebody really close to me, like hit one out of the park success wise. Yeah. And it was cool. Cause I watched him prepare to become successful. So it really kind of clicked a light bulb in my head. Like, Oh, this, this doesn't just happen to people on TV. You can actually do this. And I saw what he did. Like I used to give him a hard time. Cause like I was always a kid playing outside and I love playing football and throwing playing catch and whatnot and i remember you know like i remember being like hey dude you want to come play catch and he's like no man i gotta go study for my sats i'm like what what is wrong with you dude and he would like make flashcards and like just like words he didn't know and he'd just go through them and through them and through them and then he he crushed you know all of his test scores and then you know got accepted into all all the military academies and those were the only schools he even applied for and i was just like damn dude that dude just yeah. I, I watched, I watched that. And so it was cool for me to learn from your younger brother yeah, and be sure. like, you know, not that I didn't learn anything from my <clears throat> older brother, but it was just one of my biggest lessons, first lessons in success. And, yeah. I mean, you, you typically don't, you know, it's usually the older brother teaching, teaching younger brothers. So that, that is pretty cool. Um, did he choose the Navy because you were in it? Um, no, actually he got accepted to the academy before i oh, no before sure. i joined oh, okay. but he yeah he wanted to go a different path he wanted to fly and i you know i we grew up around a marine corps air base in yuma and i i just remember you know thankfully my parents you know were really big on making sure that me and my brothers understood that you know the whole cliche freedom isn't free respect these individuals you know wearing uniforms because their life is about something bigger than just a paycheck insurance etc um and so i was all i always looked up to military guys and so i always felt like i would go someday and then as i was getting older i started studying and special forces really appealed to me just the challenge of it and um coupled with some advice my dad gave me he told me as a kid he said eli you know i'm a pharmacist you know it is what it is i've made my bed tried to make the best of it but if i could give you any piece of advice he said Cause I think he, you know, wishes he could probably go back and redo it all over. But he was like, Hey, one of the keys to being happy in your career is to do something, you know, that you would basically do for free. Like you loved it so much. You'd do it for free. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of that lesson is that, you know, sometimes if you love something so much, there's a good chance you'll get good at it, good, good at it. And then the money will come later. But, you know, I think a lot of people make, you know, decisions based on security and money and then they you know then they wind up being like what the hell am i doing yeah yeah no i mean purpose is what is what makes people happy you know i mean how many how many uh super successful you know wealthy beyond what they can even fucking spend in the rest of their life people are out there that are fucking miserable a lot of them yeah you know um there's an element of struggle that that needs to exist uh you know and and an overabundance of money at a certain point removes that to to a degree with which I think it, it kind of makes people miserable. They get so comfortable that it's it's boring and they and they start going crazy. But there's also a lot of people that, that yeah do exactly that is that they they set their entire life up based on you know money or what's going to make them you know as, as much money as possible or be as successful as possible without 
weaving in, uh, you know, a passion for, for what the fuck you're doing. And, and, you know, I would say I'm, I'm maybe an example of that is that, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for 12 years now and, uh, you know, it started with something that I just, I love to do. I did it, you know, as, as a, a hobby, uh, before I did it professionally and because that's what I really enjoy doing. I just love dogs and, and turned it into, a business and, and, you know, for years, several years, it was really difficult. You know, there was very little money and, and what have you. And it, and it got to the point where, um, where it became successful and more successful. And, 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 you know, now it's gotten to the point where like, I'm just focused on the things that I enjoy doing and, and it's, you know, grown to a point with which, you know, it, it's easy to do that, you know, and not have to, to struggle and worry all the time, which is really great. But right. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more like, you know, your dad's dad's advice is spot on. It sounds like that that then was kind of the catalyst for for you joining. Yeah, it was it was a big part of it. Um, you know, mission has always been important to me. Like, I, I think we're all wired, you know, certain ways. And like if I'm not doing something or if I can't parlay something I'm doing into something bigger, like that has a bigger mission, count me out. man. I I just can't. I don't care you know, how much money, you know, is involved or title or, you know, what, whatever it is, if there's no mission, I'm out. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I was always eyeballing the military and then, uh, I was actually going to the U university of Arizona and, uh, nine 11 happened. I was starting my senior year there. And so, you know, um, I actually dropped out that, that first, that week. Yeah. And then, sure. Yeah. And then I, you know, I went down, joined the Navy and then flew up to uh, Great Lakes immediately. I, I think I was there. I think my first day in the Navy was like September 20th. So, oh, shit. Yeah. Fucking right away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking badass. Yeah. Was uh, was it the Navy because your brother uh, was at the academy? Or? No, it wasn't. It was actually because, um, you know, as going back to, you know, my dad gave me that piece of advice. I started really, you know, really thinking on that and started started to really focus down okay i think i want to be in the military what what do i want to do in the military and i started reading a bunch of military literature you know read carlos hathcock's book and you know many others and then you know i actually used to hang out in barnes and noble a lot and just read and um i started going through like sf marine force recon those all look cool rangers that looks cool um, but then when i started reading seal literature like it just i think it uh kind of ignited something in me, you know, that the others didn't. And I think a big piece of it was, um, I think, you know, all of, a, all of them are good in, at their own thing. But I think one of the things that really uh, awakened me was the fact that, that, you know, everybody and a lot of the books were saying that it was the hardest training in DOD. Yeah. And I just really wanted to test myself in that way. Yeah. And, you know, I also liked, I also loved the water. Or I thought I did. <laughs> I did until I got <laughs> until there. I got there, and you know, and so <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, jumping out of planes, blowing stuff up, shooting stuff, hunting bad guys. I would do that for free, absolutely, <laughs> Dad. I, I figured I found it out. It. So um, that's that's kind of led yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, from a a conditioning standpoint, I mean, going into your senior year or being a senior. I mean, were you in, in the kind of shape that, that you obviously felt confident enough to show up? But I mean, had you been training with any of that in mind? Yeah. So, um, well, th this, this is a pretty good story about failure, but, um, I, you know, uh, I remember when I was right out of high school, um, I was, I was dating a young girl at the time whose dad was the Sergeant major at the Marine Corps air station there in Yuma. And he was cool enough. I think it was him. It, I think it was him that hooked me up with uh, somebody, somebody at YPG, Yuma Proving Grounds, where we do a lot of, used to do a lot of free fall and stuff like that. And there were some SEALs out there. And, and either the recruiter or he hooked me up with him, I can't remember. But I went out and talked to the first SEAL I'd ever talked to. And I said, hey, man, I'm thinking about doing this. And he's like, okay, you know, where are you at physically? And I told him. And he's like, okay, well, you need to, you need to get up to at least where you can do the minimums and, you know, and then at that point go, cause the only way you can find out if you have what it takes is to show up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was, I don't think that was the best advice. <laughs> yeah. Just check the bare minimum box. Yeah. And yeah. And so <laughs> me being a knucklehead, you know, I kept that in the back of my mind. Okay. 
you know, because, you know, you, you even read the books, you know, where it's like, hey, this is a mental thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, it de- you know, a lot of the books will say, you know, it doesn't matter how many push-ups you can do necessarily, you know, once you get there, you know, as long as you get your foot in the door, all that matters is that no matter what, you won't quit. And I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm rolling in on that and, uh, you know, come to find, and, and then when I, when I was in college, I enrolled in something called the Ranger, Ranger Challenge. Yeah. So it was like an ROTC program that was preparing guys to go to maybe ranger school or, you know, some do some special forces in the army. And so I, I was doing that, you know, to try and prepare physically. And, uh, I mean, they weren't brutal workouts, but they were, they were decent, you know? And so, um, long story short, I ended up, I ended up showing up, you know, I ended up showing up to buds with a pretty bare minimum, you know, physicality. And I'm not like a, I'm not like a, really physical specimen, you know, you're like, yeah, man, I, I'm looking at you. I get it. <laughs> but, um, no. And, uh, and I was also born with, uh, either asthma or exercise induced bronchitis. I got multiple diagno- diagnoses from, you know, many doctors. And basically at the end of the day, whichever one is right. The bottom line is even after like an albuterol and albuterol treatment my lungs only function at like 60 percent of what they're supposed to so as you know like with all the aerobic um running swimming you know etc you know if you're only functioning on 60 percent of your lungs you know you're already quite a bit behind the power curve so i show up there with this you know pretty poor idea of preparation and it showed i mean like i was i was hurting yeah i did you know i did make it through hell week on my first in my first class with Bud's class 242, but you know, I'd failed to, I'd failed to run. I had failed to swim. And then post hell week, I failed life-saving three times, which at the time was a weed out evolution. And I know that goes back and forth sometimes, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but I got, you know, taken to an academic review board. And the message was, listen, young man, clearly you're tough. You made it through hell week but we need the best of the best here and you are not it. And on top of that, um, I was ranked in the bottom 25% of my peer evals, which as you know, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a big part of that, just taking ownership of it was I hadn't learned yet to focus on the boys. I was all focused on me. And mm. when you get, it's easy like for the, you know, your, your viewers and whatnot to, you know, be like, Oh, well, of course, man, you got to be like, you got to be a team player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it. It's easy to be a team player when you've, you know, when you haven't been awake for four and a half days, Mm -hmm. right? When you've, when you've slept, when you're, when, when you're, you got a full belly, you, when you're not terrified of failure and just getting your, your ass whipped. Right. Um, But when you, that's when you really find out what you're about when Mm -hmm. the chips are down. And so, and at that point, I wasn't that guy yet. I was focused on me. Hey, am I doing good? Hey, don't, don't, don't extend yourself. Don't, you know, Hey, if Mike, Mike, Mike looks like he's hurting over there, but I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to extend an olive branch. I'm not going to ask Mike if he wants to bump out of the two slot and I'll take it yeah. so I can take the pounding and Mike can get a break. I'm going to stay right where I'm at. Cause I'm comfortable. And, and you know, those are, those are the big reasons why I had to go away Yeah, and, you know, so they, they medically, uh, or medically, they performance, performance drop. Performance drop, yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, what was the mentality? Like, I guess, looking back on that now, you realize that that's what you needed at that time. Yeah. Was there bitterness, animosity? There was. And I think I think a lot of that was my own immaturity. You yeah. know, I, I hadn't learned yet to take ownership and accountability for not only my own poor preparation, but, you know, for, you know, everything in my life. Hey, if, you know, and I, as I, as I got older and more mature and I started, you know, hanging around, you know, guys that sharpened me and understood that, you know, you'd hear the common message was, Hey, 95% of where you're at in life is your own fault or, or it's, you know, to your own credit. Now that's not to say that there's not luck here and there. You got, you got a break, but, um, you know, so much of it is comes down to our own choices and our own decisions. And like, if you, as a man, if you don't learn to take ownership of that, you, you're never going to be successful, period. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, to me, what's, what's 
you know, encouraging about you, but disheartening about society is, is how few people actually understand that, you know, and, and would take yep. that scenario because for those of you listening that aren't, aren't intimately familiar with the, the seal process and what that looks like, you know, to, to be, to go that far, you know, which is about halfway through training, you know, or I mean, not quite, I guess, but still, I mean, you're, you're past hell week and, uh, you know, you, you've, you've gotten a, a, a pretty good kick in the nuts that you've proven that you can deal with and then to leave there to to be able to come back like that's that's not a quick or easy process right you know and you have to start all over again and it's going to be a few years later you know so it's like to even come back from that whether you quit whether you med drop performance drop whatever you know just coming back again is something that that takes an, an, an exceeding amount of uh, determination and, and grit to, to make it back there, especially knowing what you have to do all over again. Um, did you, so you went to the fleet and you did, you did a couple deployments in the fleet. Yeah. And that's one of the hard, you, you mentioned several of the elements that are, you know, you know, definitely problematic or difficult in that situation. But one of the biggest ones is it's not like the army or the Marine Corps where I, Hey, I can go join an infantry unit and still accomplish my mission of what I would consider fighting. Like, and I don't mean to disrespect sailors. I've got so many brothers that, you know, just, I love to death. And that was one of the best parts about going to the fleet for me is the guys I met and the gals I met and just some, many of them are still friends to this day, but I really wanted to fight for my country, especially, you know, joining the week after nine 11, you know, and it, um, and I, I, I didn't feel like I was going to get a chance to do that on the ship. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I went out to the USS Gettysburg. They gave me a choice. They said, Hey, you can either go to Japan or you could go to Florida or Virginia. And Japan sounded kind of cool. I, I, you know, thought that might be cool to see a different culture, a different side of things. But, um, I was thinking <clears throat> about, Hey, if I want to come back, you know, what's the best chance of me coming back? And I thought if I stayed stateside and, you know, was around maybe a motivator or something that you know, could help me with the package and the paperwork to come back, you know, and the Navy doesn't have to spend a boatload of money now to send me back across, you know, the world. I was like, okay, that's, that's probably my best chance to come back. And so I chose to go to Florida, the USS Gettysburg and be a gunner's mate there. Yeah. I'm curious, like men- mentality wise, if I put myself in your shoes, I, I would, I would find it hard not to at least uh, to a certain extent have that almost senioritis the day you show up. Oh yeah. You know, of just like, this is fucking temporary. Like I don't, you know, like check the bare minimum. Like how, how hard was it to, I mean, fuck motivation. Like you're not going to have any motivation. How hard was it to, to find the discipline to, to make yourself do a good enough job or, or was the motivation knowing that you had to, to be able to get back? Was that enough or what, like, what was your frame of mind like then? Well, it was not only that, you know, knowing that if I was going to come back, I knew that the, that the command was going to have to release me. So I knew that I had to do a good job. Um, but also to, you know, thankfully, you know, my parents always, whether I did it or not, they tried to teach us, Hey, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, you're putting your name on something. And that was something that I was really bad at too. Like, just like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. I, I'll just, I, this doesn't really mean anything to me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a good job at it, you know? And so, um, I think those were, those were a couple things that I knew that I was going to have to get better at. And I knew that one of the biggest things that I was going to have to get better at and look for opportunities while I was on the ship was to learn how to grow up, take accountability for myself and my own mistakes, but also to put guys before myself, my team before myself and just the people I work with. And, you know, on the ship, you know, even though I wasn't getting the opportunity to fight, it is a rough life. Like I, I, I consider it being on a floating prison, honestly, because it's, it's worse than prison because you have to actually work. Yeah. You know, like you, you don't just get to do kind of what you want and have all that free time. Like you've got a full time fucking job on top of being in prison. Yeah. And, and honestly, in the, you know, it's much more than a full-time job, you know, for those of you out there that don't have any family that, you know, are on a ship or anything like that. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because in the Navy, when you're in the fleet on a ship, you'll work your full day, you'll start at like 
seven, you'll work till, you know, five, and then you'll have to stand a night watch every single night, no weekends off. I mean, you'll, you'll either stand like the, you'll either stand like the eight to midnight watch or the eight to balls, balls to four or four to four to eight. And then you start your day over again. So, I mean, sleep deprivation every single night, you know, and it's just like, um, it, the, that was kind of good for me too, because it, it did help me grow up, teach me responsibility. Um, and you know, there were many, many times where I could have, you know, taken the easy road and looked out for myself, but I started <clears throat> to work on, okay, how can I, how can I look out for Mike in this situation? How can I cover down on him? Even if it means that I have to stay here, you know, on a day off or whatever. And so I needed that. What do you suppose the the catalyst for that switch in mentality was? Do you know? I think it was, um, you know, just I've always been the type of guy. I failed a lot. I failed at a lot of stuff, but I always try and like figure out why or then figure out, okay, if I am going to be successful, what's it going to take? Why didn't it work that time? What can I go back in? look at dissect and where can I make changes? And, um, you know, I think, I think that that was a big, that was a big reason why, you know, I wanted to, you know, shore that stuff up because I realized clearly what I did didn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how do I attack it again differently? And I've, I've had to apply that in business too. I'm sure you have as well. Just like, I mean, it's, it's difficult and there's so many things that can get you. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of success, I think, is like failing enough to learn like what doesn't work or what doesn't work for you, and then going back and being resilient and giving it another go. No, yeah, no two ways about it. I mean, that's the thing that I think a lot of people, um, you know, on the outside looking in, it, you know, I, I've talked about this a number of times. You know, the must be nice mentality that drives you fucking crazy. That you know, there's there's a lot of people that that just see the brochure of your life, of your business, you know, et cetera, yeah. that they don't see just like in the seal teams, like, you know, the brochure, be someone special. It's, you know, try folded, you know, a handful of pictures of all the coolest, funnest, sexiest shit that we do in the seal teams. What it doesn't show is the other 95% of being fucking miserable yeah. and building pallets and being gone all the time and, you know, missing kids birthdays and, and all right. that kind of shit, you know? So, um, there, there's a lot to that, uh, that, that, you know, I think, uh, you know, business wise that, that you learn in the SEAL teams as well as, uh, you know, apply in, in business where, you know, a lot of figuring it out is learning the hard way and, and more of learning what not to do than it is learning what to do, you know, right. but, um, so you spent, uh, how, how long were you, were you on the Gettysburg for <clears throat> two and a half years? And, and was the, once the time was up where you could now come back, was, was there any difficulty yeah. on their end? So the, in my academic <clears throat> review board, I, probably cause I made it through Hell week. I, I really don't know, but I wasn't in there when they were <laughs> deciding to <laughs> drop me, but they, uh, they said our recommend, they wrote in my, um, whatever my <laughs> performance drop that we recommend that you come back in a year. So I had that recommendation in there, but when that time came, you know, the way it works on a ship or in most commands is, is okay, CEO, commanding officer, you can let this young man go back, but you're not getting a replacement because you chose to do that. And so the CEO was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to leave the weapons department short one extra, one more sailor, you know, because I want my ship functioning at its max capacity. Yeah. And so... I, I had to spend a full two and a half years and it was probably, probably a good thing for me. Yeah. When, uh, ap- after that year, did you sit, did you walk up and be like, Hey, it's been a year if I can time to go back. And they're like, no, you're not going. Or how did that? It was, con- yeah, it was constantly me, you know, talking to my superiors like, Hey, this is what I want to do. Can you help me make this happen? What do you think the likelihood of it is? What, what, do, what do you need to see in me to, you know, recommend and support that for me? You know, the, just those types of things, you know, um, trying to trying to follow up, build relationships and, you know, see what what it was going to take. Yeah. Shy that. of banging the CEO's daughter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I need to do? Do I need to bang your daughter to get out of here? Right. Um, so once once you finally went back, um, was there obviously there was a renewed sense of responsibility, accountability, whatever. 
shape wise were you in much better shape at that point going back? yeah i was i was in much better shape but um still i wasn't like one of the top performers there yeah. you know i was always you know like i was a horrible runner yeah i i barely passed the majority of our runs and every time i'd come through <clears throat> you know i was dry heaving and i think a lot of it had to do with like i mentioned earlier you know if my lungs only functioned at 60 percent mm -hmm. you know what they're supposed to and I should be able to run pretty well because I've got I'm tall. I've got long legs, but yeah. you know, just wasn't a great runner. No, I hear you with the with the lung thing. I I was in lung wise, I was in phenomenal shape going through training and and while I was at SEAL Team Three. But then as a as a SQT instructor, I got valley fever and lost. Similarly, I lost about forty percent of my lung capacity permanently, and so I'm, I'm where you're at now. I guess I have been for so long. It's it's just kind of normal, but right. But uh, I, I hear you there. I certainly don't have the the VO2 max or bottom end that I did, uh, and not just because I'm older, you know. But um, how old were you at this point? So when I went back, I was 24. Okay. And then I graduated when I think I was 25. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you go back to training. Uh, any hiccups or problems other than just the you know tough runs, and whatever? Any performance rolls or anything like that? No, I didn't. I made it straight through with Bud's class two five six, and uh, you know there were a, the runs were always the 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 looming. Hey, this might get me dropped. I was always on the bubble for runs and think yeah. think like the first. It was crazy, Mike, because I was like my first time back in first phase in class two five six i didn't even know if i was going to make it to hell week because i got pneumonia in first phase right off the bat with my with my screwed up lungs because pneumonia obviously attacks your lungs like i was i wasn't passing my runs and i was like oh this is like if i failed one more run i was gone yeah. and i was like dude i'm not even gonna make it to Two. hell week and then secondly they can send me right back out to the fleet. So I was definitely nervous about that. But I passed my final run before going into Hell Week. And I'm like, at least I'm going to get an opportunity to go into Hell Week. And, you know, so. And they, they made you go through it again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, for those of you listening, I mean, that, to me, that's pretty fucking remarkable. I mean, that, to have gone through Hell Week twice. How was the second time compared to the first time? You know, it was kind of cool because that, to me, that was where I really got to put to to the test. Hey, um, did you learn anything out there in the two and a half years? You know, and it was it was cool because I caught myself at times, you know, wanting to like shrink into my own comfort zone and be like, no, stop, you know, check on him, you know, and and I'm not saying like I was you know, Leonidas out there, but <laughs> it, just the mindset was so much different. Like I was actually, you know, really trying to be a team player during, and it was cool too, because like I could tell, because obviously it's the craziest thing anybody's ever done until that point, yeah. you know? And so there's a anxiety level that, you know, is, you know, probably, you know, especially for guys that don't get wigged out easily, there's an anxiety level there and you could see it, you could feel it. And it was kind of cool to be the guy that be, would be like, Hey, this is how this is going to go. I remember, um, you know, walking out, we were walking, you know, you know, you know how you start in the classroom, you're watching movies and whatnot. And then, you know, they break you out differently every time, but, um, you know, they were walking us out to the tents to, to go sleep yeah. before breakout. <laughs> and then they broke, like, I, I was like, you know, it was totally alert. And I saw some of the instructors in the, in the, in the trucks. I'm like, Oh, here we go. Yeah. Get, get ready, boys. It's going to be a long week, but it was cool. I remember one of the guys in my boat crew who ended up, I think going to, going to like seal teammate or something really good dude. But I remember at the very end of hell week, right after the demo pits, we came back to the center and they were beating us like they always do. And they were like, hey, yo, you guys don't want to put out Roger that. <laughs> well, we're going to, that's fine. We'll just, we'll run, we'll run you to lunch. And then we'll keep this party going. And one of the guys next to me, he was, we were, we were low crawling up this berm. And like, you know, at that point, five and a half days later, you're chafed beyond belief. Every movement is extreme very painful and like he, he we're low crawling up this berm wet and sandy and you know he said hey Eli I don't think I can do this much more man and I'm like I was like dude I'm like 
hang in there. I said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to come, we're going to get to the top of this berm and there's going to be an American flag on the other side. Cause I, I just knew like I, it was kind of the same way my last hell week was secured. I'm like, dude, we are like moments away from being secured. And I was like, dude, just hang in there. So it was kind of, it was cool to be the guy that could encourage and be like, Hey brother, we're good. Yeah. You got this. Yeah. So I see the guy that later on you're like, you remember when I carried you through Hell Week, my No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's the that, that's that's one of the crappy things is that only six of us from my class stayed on the West Coast. Everybody else went to the East Coast. So, yeah. you know, I feel like I lost, you know, I lost contact with so many of those guys that you know we went through Hell together. And yeah, uh, um, yeah. Um, to compare the two in terms of. You know, I'm, uh, that span, I'm sure they were, they were pretty consistent with evolutions and how it went and whatever. But do, does one stick out as being different or more more difficult or, or easier or different in any way? In You mean in Hell Week? Hmm. I don't, I can't remember anything that was, um, anything that was so much different. I mean, obviously the dip, the difference for me was in my own mentality. Yeah. And just knowing what's coming. Like there was not that fear of the unknown. My mindset in the first one was what almost got me. And that's what gets everybody. But I remember, you know, as a kid, your parents often teach you, you know, how do you eat the elephant, Eli? You eat it one bite at a time. And I remember my first hell week with Bud's class 242, it was Monday night. So we'd been doing this for 24 hours. Like in by by if you if you know, just to give you an idea for those of you guys that haven't been through Hell Week, most of you, but um if you if if you go at that pace for 24 hours, if you go at that pace for six hours, you're gonna feel pretty damn tired. You mm-hmm. go at that pace for 24 hours, you you're gonna be like, I've never felt this exhausted in my life. I've never been this cold, this tired, this miserable. And that's how I felt. And I was like, and I started looking to, I started looking at that entire elephant. And I remember we were getting surf tortured on Monday night and they were, you know, sending us into the water. All right, let these guys, you know, bring them right up to the point of hypothermia, get them up about face, walk out. Now our little chart says we can leave them in for this amount of time before they get close to hypothermia. Okay, walk them out. And come out and i remember we were doing this for hours and i'm thinking to myself i've never been this cold never been this tired never been this miserable and i've still got four more days of this there's no way there's just no way yeah and so i was trying to eat that elephant you know all at once and it almost got me like i started to like i I felt like i was starting to mentally go down that you know that spiral of death mental death and i think the only thing that saved me was stubbornness like just being stubborn yeah but no, I, yeah, I, I hear you on the stubbornness. I mean, for me, I, you know, for whatever reason, it, I'm sure it can be uh, attributed to, you know, my parents, uh, other influences, you know, a martial arts uh, trainer, teacher that I had, uh, you know, just some experiences I had in high school, whatever, in, in terms of the stubbornness and resilience. But uh, I, I found myself thinking of that uh, pretty much the entire time of, of just always thinking like, this sucks, but I know it's going to be over at some point, you know, like, like they, they can't do it forever. Like, yeah, right. there's still a lot left and, and this fucking sucks, but the sun's going to come up, you know, we're going to go to fucking chow. Like this is going to be over at some point. Like it's not going to last forever. Like right. I just, I just always kept repeating that to myself and, and for whatever reason was able to convince myself of that fairly easily. And, and, and just always relied on that one simple kind of mantra is that, you know, that this too shall pass, type, you know, type of mentality. But um, it, it's interesting having having been an instructor, which I'm, I'm 99% sure I actually worked your hell week uh, okay. a, a, as an instructor, but I was a brown shirt rollback instructor, not a phase instructor at that time. For 5'6 or for 4'2? 5'6. Yeah, I okay. wasn't there at 4'2, but, but uh, you know, I, I most of the shifts I did were either the fucking midnight to 8 uh, or the 4 to midnight. Um, you know, there was only one or two classes during my – my tenure as an instructor that I worked like the, the normal day shift, which was the worst in my opinion. But, uh, as, as an instructor, it was, you know, as a student, I think midnight day, it's pretty, pretty comfortably the, the shittiest fucking shift. But, yeah. but, uh, anyway, um, what's well, funny too, cause as a student, like there's always a hammer squad. Oh, yeah. One of the shifts is always the hammer yeah. squad. And it's usually when, when all the, uh, it's usually when all the, uh, high ranking, 
Oh, yeah. just go home, right? Oh, yeah. And it's just like a known thing. And it's like, yeah. you know, Bravo shift. You're like, oh, God, here comes Bravo shift. They're fresh. Yeah. You know, they're pissed off. They're ready to just, you yeah. know, kick the snot out of us, you yeah. know, and, and we've just been going, going straight. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it's never, never, never good to see the, the uh, fresh hammers yeah. show up. Well, and, and, you know, one thing that I learned the, the very first hell week I worked as, as an instructor is, is how exhausting it is for the staff, which, which I, I was not expecting, you know, yeah. I really wasn't. Cause it's like, and, and as a student, you're like, God damn, these motherfuckers split it up into three different shifts and we, you know, we yeah. got to eat all of them. But it's like, you know, each shift that comes in, like when you, when you come in for that eight hours, you're fucking 110%. Yeah. You know, your balls to the wall nonstop. Whereas, I got to work a couple, yeah. you know, at the at the end of my career, and yeah. I felt the same way. Yeah. It was like I was surprised at how difficult yeah. it was. I was like, fuck, I'm more tired than than I would be as a student right now. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know how the fuck, like, Jesus Christ, how, how am I this tired? You know, it was, uh, it was fucking wild. But um, all right, so you go through the second, uh, second hell week, then you end up graduating with that class, and then you went straight to team three. Yeah. Um, what was your impression? So you were at Team 3 at, uh, what, 05-ish? Yeah, 06 was, yeah, was, was my first deployment, yeah. Um, I mean, that's – and you went to Iraq first, right? Yeah. Or all three of them were Yeah, it was, it was interesting for me because um, we graduated from SQT um, and SEAL Team 3 was already downrange. So they told us, okay, you know, we went and checked in walked over to SEAL Team 3, checked in, and they were like, hey, you guys aren't deploying. We've decided you're just going to go to schools and wait for your platoons to get back, and then you're going to get you know get embedded with them, and then you're going to start training. We're like, okay, cool. So it was interesting for me because I had just gotten married between BUDS and SQT, and so I told my wife, hey, babe, you know, they said that I'm not going, I'm not going overseas, so why don't you go ahead and move out here to San Diego? <laughs> You already know where this story yeah. is going. Two weeks later, yeah. you know, she moves. Good news. She, yeah, two weeks later, she moves, like, she packs all her stuff up in her car, drives out to San Diego. And then they're like, oh, change of plans. You guys are going to deploy uh, right after you go to SEER school. And yeah. so they sent us to SEER school. <laughs> and then we deployed and we joined SEAL Team 3 while they were there. And I got put into, uh, I think four of us got put into Bravo Platoon. So, that was that was wild because like in our SQT like we didn't even you know back then you didn't have yeah. nods you didn't have lasers you didn't just have throwing you to the lions down, yeah man. you're the learning curve went like you know and it was just like you're just drinking through a fire hose trying not to get anybody killed yeah. working on gear and tech you've never even touched yeah so uh, so you got married in between that time was was your wife somebody that you met out on the east coast when you were in the fleet or how no, she, uh, before, before I went into the military, before I joined up, um, I met her in Tucson. Oh, no shit. Yeah. We stayed friends for like five years. Um, my older brother worked with her at Wells Fargo and, um, I joke around with her now. Um, but she was 17 when I met her and I was like, no, I, I like you. <laughs> I'm attracted to you, but you're kind of jailbait and I'm already a big enough moron. You know, I don't need to get in any more trouble. And, uh, and I just gotten out of a long distance relationship. And so, um, I was like, yeah, let's just be friends. And yeah, she wasn't looking for that. And yeah. so we just stayed friends for a long, you know, a long period of time. And then, um, it was interesting because she flew out to florida when i was on the uss gettysburg the last weekend i was on that ship and we went to uh what's the joe's crab shack well oh. we definitely went to joe's <laughs> crab shack but um what's the disney world out there and so we hung yeah. out and you know we, we we talked about you know dating and i was like hey just so you know this is what i'm getting into this is i'm driving back on monday across the country to go try seal training again and this is what it's going to look like if if this relationship works out and so it turned out to be i think a blessing in disguise because i got to you know kind of watch how she handled long distance relationships because she was finishing up her degree at university of arizona i was starting buds and so it started as a long distance relationship so i got to kind of see right off the bat is this going to work with this girl is yeah you know is you know and so that was kind of cool but yeah we got married at the courthouse in tucson you know pretty classy yeah always been a classy flip-flops and she's holding her purse and yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah it worked out that's fucking classic so um so she moved packs all her shit moves out there and then you fucking leave yep 
how uh, did that cause some some issues or, or was she just kind of like, well, this is what I fucking signed up for, Roger that? No, I definitely caused some issues. I think, you know, like most married people or most couples in general, you know, it's it's uh, it's all it's all great and honeymoony until it gets real. And um, to kind of like take some of it, the responsibility myself, I think, it, you know, it was kind of tough because. <clears throat> I was going off to war and I was going to join guys. I was going to join guys that I didn't know that I'd never worked with. I knew where I was going to be in the ranking order. I knew I was going to be just a bottom feeder. Hey, do this, do that, you know, and, and I knew I was, you know, and not only that, but you don't know if you're coming back, you know? So it was like, I had a really high stress level, you know, right before I left and she could like, I, you know, she could totally see it on me. And she was like, what's, you know, it definitely affected our relationship. And then she didn't know anybody in San Diego. So, you know, you had all that going on as well. And so, yeah, it was definitely difficult, but, you know, I'm grateful that, I mean, we're still married to this day. And that's, yeah. as you know, that's freaking super rare. That's rare. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just grateful that, you know, she's stuck with me all this time. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, so that first deployment, drinking from the fire hose, um, how how did the level of trust work uh, in terms of that new platoon, like integrating you in there and, and kind of the trial by fire? Like, how did that go? Because that, that had to have been not just stressful for you, but I can imagine being a seasoned platoon guy where maybe this is, you know, third, fourth fucking combat deployment. Yeah. And this guy or guys come rolling, you know, still shit and buds chow from yeah from sqt and it's like why don't you fucking sit over there and we'll let you know if we need shit packed or carried or, or whatever i mean how how did that work yeah i think you know because uh i had you know definitely i feel like i got i wouldn't say two extremes but i was a new like i was a new guy during that half deployment and then i continued my my run of new guyness you know for the next two two years and i worked for chris kyle right after that so I worked for Rourke Denver was my OIC yeah. um, during that platoon. And we had some solid, solid guys in the platoon. But I think a lot of it usually stems down from leadership and what the culture of the platoon is going to be like. And on that first platoon, basically the theme was, look, here's the deal. You, you know, you're welcome here. You're going to do all <clears throat> you're going to do all the jobs that nobody wants to do. We don't want to hear any complaining about it. You're going to treat everybody with respect. That's a given. But, um, you know, unless you're, unless you're screwed up, we're not going to mess with you. That was, that was the culture there. And that definitely happened where guys screwed up and, you know, they, they paid the man. Yeah. Um, and you know, so, it, you know, that, that was one of those things where you just walked around on eggshells and you knew that you were a minnow swimming with sharks and you better try and learn as fast as you can <laughs> try and help out as much as you can and always like there were four of us like you know we'd walk into rooms like back to back and just like ready to you know yeah. like the but, four fucking new guys in prison almost exactly yeah. that's kind of how it was how uh how long was it from the time that you were boots on the ground until uh you actually did did something with the platoons yeah i mean it was right it was pretty much right away they no were shit. that was really cool they they implemented us right away i mean we were just we were turret gunning and we were carrying machine like the 48 we were carrying pigs yeah. or more saws mark 46s and uh at first it was a lot of turret gunning and then once we proved that like we weren't going to shoot anybody or or whatever um they started letting us go on patrols and then you know towards the end we were even going on sniper overwatches so wow. it we were blown away because we were the only guys from our class that were doing that yeah i mean that's unheard of right it I mean, was fucking like from it, the time you graduated sqt till you're doing legit real world missions was a matter of month a month yeah, two months yeah, yeah it was Dude, it was fucking crazy it was wild and that you, was way that's super fucking crazy. and like i like i said you know there was that was a ton of pressure because you know you're trying to fit in with guys that you have haven't worked up with you have to earn their respect and you're working with a bunch of gear that you've never worked with before. So you're trying to figure out how nods work and yeah. how your app hill works, your laser and like, you know, how to drive a hum, you know, Hummer at yeah. night. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just, there was so much stuff and you were just trying not to screw anything up. Yeah. To me, what, what it also does though, is it makes me appreciate 
um, the the gradual step by step kind of very uh, surgically or, or strategically um, organize the way the SEAL teams work in terms of bringing guys up to speed. Yeah. Because if you look at um, and think about, say, 0300 infantry Marines, like all of them are that way. It's like they go through boot camp, they go through, you know, their fucking MOS. And then, you know, many of them, that's the case is that, you know, six months after they join the military, they're in Iraq fucking shooting at people, um, you know, and, and so it, it, it furthers my respect and I have a, a ton of respect for Marines and, and all service members. But, uh, you know, in, infantry Marines and Army guys like those guys in some ways really uh, have to take a big bite out of a shit sandwich. And in some cases that way where, yeah. uh, you know, they, they don't get a lot of specialized training or, or they're handheld or, or brought up or mentored the way special operations guys do, which I, I get that it's kind of, you know, apples and oranges in a way in terms of, of mission and skill set. But the danger is the absolute same. You know, Absolutely. in fact, I'd say it's, it's probably even a little higher for Marines and army because they, I they, would guarantee, I would, you know, I so. would agree. Um, it just, it, I think it further makes me appreciate, uh, you know, the situation a lot of those guys find themselves in 18, 19 years old and in that, that position. But, um, you were in the, in the Sunni triangle, the Fallujah Ramadi area during that, uh, deployment. I, I started in, uh, Habania. Okay. So about 30 minutes from Ramadi. And what, uh, what was the, the typical uh, mission set? And I know you mentioned sniper overwatch, uh, towards the end, but is that most of what you were doing was recon by patrol slash fire and sniper overwatch just looking yeah, for shit yeah there was a lot of sniper overwatches going on and then we were doing a lot of da's at the time um we we were actually i remember crossing the euphrates a lot we would like we would load our humvees you know on one of these army flatbed like boats and then we would cross the euphrates <clears> and then <throat> we would do a lot of da's in a lot of rural areas yeah i remember doing that a lot um but yeah, sniper overwatches were probably, if I had to guess, I'd probably say, you know, close to the majority of the, yeah. the work that we were doing. Were there any any missions in particular that, that you went on that were really um, hair raising in terms of like you guys really kicked over a hornet's nest and were like, holy shit, um, you know, and, and really had to battle it out that you recall? Yeah, I think I think that's relative just to like, you know, what what you're you know, war experience, you know, encompasses that, that deployment, I think was probably the, you know, you know, for me personally, in my own experience was probably the, the, the most scared I've ever been in combat just because, um, you know, um, I, we were doing a sniper overwatch towards the end of my time there. And I think I'm pretty sure it was my first overwatch and I was carrying a 48 machine gun. So we inserted at night, probably at like, I don't know, one or two in the morning. You know, you, you in that situation, if there's a family in the house, you can either keep the family there or you can let them go. Either way, you know, if you let them go, they're going to go tell people that the Americans took our house. They're in there. And if you keep them inside, by that point in the war, this was 2006, people knew if the Ritlands aren't coming out of their house to go to school and go to work, there's a good chance that Americans are in there. And yeah. so um, I remember going in and we weren't going to be extracted until nightfall. That was the plan. And then, uh, you know, I was covering one, one, you know, corner of the house. I think I was covering the eastern corner with my 48 and I was all by myself. So I like, you know, from two in the morning until, you know, whenever you're going to be extracted, you know, Hey, if anybody slips through and, you know, lobs a grenade up on the roof where the snipers are not, you know, that's going to be a real bad day for me in so many, so many different ways. And so, but I remember, you know, just kind of like, you know, watching, watching this thing go down and, um, you know, watching the people do what the guys do, what they were doing, watching snipers, you know, watch this road. Cause we were going to have some, I think it was Marines or army dudes patrolling through, you know, one of the, one of the main roads there. And they wanted to make sure that these guys had some cover and also watch for guys planting IEDs. And, uh, a cup, a couple of our snipers took some shots in the morning, um, killed some, killed some guys. And then I remember it's probably, probably around 11 in the morning, <clears throat> one of our snipers 
you know, I can't remember if he came up over comms. I think they were talking about it on comms and, you know, he ended up shooting this guy that was on my side of the house and shot right through the windshield of this car and like domed him just right in the face. And I remember looking out and I was like, oh, damn, man, that's a that's a bullet hole right in that window. It's probably like probably a good 300 yards from me. But what unfolded next really got my spidey senses up because, um, <clears throat> you know, that was I think that was the first time I'd ever seen somebody dead in more. And then I remember it was right. The car was right parked right in front of a school. And so there were a bunch of kids and women that, you know, heard it happen, started milling outside, and then they started screaming and crying. And my spidey senses went, because I knew just something instinctually, something told me like, hey, if there's one way to get me to fight and go kill, mess with my wife or my kids or whatever, just, and it's just instinctual. And mm -hmm. I was just like, I was like, oh man, we're about to get hammered. And it took a good 45 minutes for them to kind of rally, start maneuvering, form a plan. And first it started with, you know, first it started with small fire, you know, small arms fire. And then uh, what what scared the snot out of me was when they started dropping mortars on us. Because, I mean, it is like the movies where, like, you you hear it, boom, and then it's you can hear that thing whistling through the air for, you know, four or five, six seconds. And you're just, you're thinking the entire time, where's this thing landing? And, uh, you know, I just remember thinking to myself, you know, you know, during that whole ordeal and, you know, trying to, you know, make, find work. That's what I kept telling myself, find work, make sure that you're, no matter what's going on, make sure that your, uh, your corners covered down on, but yeah, that was, that was a real good, uh, real good intro for me into combat and just like, you know, um, you know, what it, what it was going to be like. And I heard one of the older guys, I think it was the guy that took the shot that kicked that whole thing off. I heard him, um, when mortar started coming up, you know, he, uh, I can't remember what he yelled out, but I th think you yelled out, everybody get down. And I, when I heard him, who was an older guy that I respected and the guy was just a killer, you know, and when I heard, when I heard the pitch in his voice go up, like it was like pay attention yeah. do exactly what he says because things it's like are, when you're a kid and you see real. your dad fucking make that quick decision or exactly. you see that side of him you haven't seen before exactly yeah um did any of the mortars end up uh hitting the building you were in or thank god no but one of them one of them hit probably a good 50 yards from my window and frag flew up you know and, and hit the window yeah but thankfully i would say you know that was probably the closest one. And, and they're, you know, you know, the deal, man, they, for the most part, those guys don't want to get killed either. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times it's just like harassing fire, see if we can get close with a couple mortars, but don't stay there too long. Cause if they locate us, you know, we're done. Yeah. And then, and then our, uh, it was our AOIC at the time, I think called in Artie, called in artillery. And that was kind of cool to see, like it took forever for that, artillery to come in but i remember it just like big army guns thundering and then hearing you know hearing it hit the tree line that we called it in on that was kind of cool yeah fuck that's badass yeah um did uh during that deployment did any of your guys get uh, killed or injured um none of the we had we had one group we had one group um i wasn't on that particular op but one group got hit by an IED and thankfully nobody was real. I think a couple guys got TBIs, but, and maybe some burns, but nothing crazy. Nobody went home. Yeah. I don't think anybody was taken off the depth chart. Yeah. And then I know one of our snipers, um, you know, took some frag, somebody lobbed a grenade on the roof and he took some frag, but thankfully there were no serious injuries that, Cause keep in mind, I was three months late to the party, Yeah, but, um, but I don't think anybody got seriously hurt, but yeah. right down the road, um, that's when, uh, Mark Lee was killed. So we had opt that night and then Mark got killed that night. And then I remember driving 
down MSR Michigan to Ramadi the next day and uh, for his little wake or his, you know, memorial service that they held there in uh, in Ramadi. And then shortly after that, and on that same day, Ryan Job was, uh, was shot. And then um, right at the end of the deployment, I remember I was, I think I was on the very last bird home right at the end of the deployment, uh, Mikey Monsor was killed. So that wasn't in our group, but they, that, that platoon was about 30 miles down the road. So, yeah. So you were, you guys were operating, uh, paralleled to TU Bruiser. Yeah. 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 So I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we ever did anything joint with them while I was there, but I mean, you know, when you're talking 30 miles, yeah. it's pretty close. Yeah. So. Um, for, for, so it sounds like you're there for about half the second half of the deployment that three, months, take yeah. three months, um, was there anything else that stood out on that deployment in terms of operations that, uh, that, that, you know, kind of that you remember vividly as, as almost like something that was impactful, you know, for, for you to, to hang on to down the yeah. road, subsequent deployments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was when I kind of realized that this isn't uh warfare is not like what i've seen in the movies like i realized how much gray area there was um and uh i realized that like not every terrorist shows up with a you know a scarf and uh you know an ak-47 yeah and that's that's one of the things that i i liked i want to talk about because i want more people to understand that you know, you see these guys, you know, some of our military individuals, you know, getting strung up, you know, for, you know, doing this or that when, you know, everybody's Monday morning quarterbacking them or judging them. And it's like, until you've been in that spot, man, you have no idea how difficult it is. Yeah, same with police. You know? No, a hundred percent. Um, and, uh, I think it was like a month and a half into my deployment, you know, I, I don't know what it was, maybe my 10th or 15th op, but we, uh, you know, we were, you know, you, sl you work at night and then you obviously sleep during the day. And I remember, you know, one of the first weeks I was there sitting in an Intel brief where the Intel officer, you know, came in and he's like, Hey, you know, you guys just need to be aware that we were getting Intel that, um, some, you know, some local, some local group is, uh, making, you know, 30 VBIEDs right now on top of everything that you guys are dealing with. So, you know, keep that in mind as you're out there doing your job, which is means vehicle born IED. Um, and so I was like, okay, I filed that away. And then, uh, it was probably about maybe a month, month and a half in that, uh, we were doing an op and I remember it was a triple hit. So, our assaulters were taking out three houses at one time and I was the turret gunner in Victor four. And so during that time in Iraq in 2006, there was a curfew. And so no Iraqis were allowed to be out past sundown. They all had to be, you know, in their, in their house. And I remember, you know, those doing that job where you're like a turret gunner, while everybody else is assaulting a lot of times it can be can get pretty boring you know honestly you're just sitting there watching the same street corner you know checking checking windows you know making making sure that you know security is set for like three or four hours i mean you'll just sit there standing and you're kind of hanging out like dog's balls honestly you know um like you're standing halfway out of the vehicle with a 50 cal and hopefully if you're lucky, you've got some like ballistic plating behind you to at least stop shots coming from your back. And I remember sitting there, you know, I was Victor four. So I was watching like our, I was watching like our, uh, our rear. And then there were three other trucks, you know, where their gunners were pointed, you know, North, South or Northeast and West. And I was pointing South watching the, the intersection to our rear. And so we're sitting there probably like an hour and a half, two hours into this op. And we had a C-130 overhead and the C-130 um, came up over comms and said, hey, beware, you guys have two 
Um, you guys have two vehicles approaching you guys, one from the north, one from the south, and they're both blacked out, meaning they're not, they don't have any headlights, um, which is, that's odd right there. They're out past curfew, you know, and, and they're blacked out. And so, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, I was like, that's kind of weird. And so turns out it was the CIA making a coffee run, right? Maybe. (laughs) I, I hope not. But anyway, um, so I'm sitting there, you know, continue watching, watching my corner and, uh, this, you know, this car, it was, I think it was a BMW. It pulls up into my intersection and, um, he just stops and I'm like, that's kind of weird. And I verified, yeah, he's, he looked, looked out under my nods and I verified he, he doesn't have any headlights on him. I'm like, what is he doing? And he's probably about a hundred yards from me. And I'm thinking to myself, my, my thoughts go back to the VBIED brief that we just got a couple weeks ago. And I'm thinking, I wonder if this is a VBIT. And I'm like hanging out of the halfway out of the turret, hundred yards away. I'm like, if this guy clacks this thing off right now, I'm done. And so it's probably my driver who I think out at that time was out of the vehicle. And so I said, Hey, um, the guy's name was Dave. I was like, Dave, he was an older guy. I was like, Dave, check this guy out. And, uh, he turns around and he looks at the car and he's like, um, he's like, Oh damn. And so Dave puts his IR laser on the car, shine, shines it in the car. And then I think he flipped on his visible laser, hit him with the visible laser. It's kind of like a, get the hell, yeah. get the hell out of there. It's kind of a universal, Get the Inter- interpreter right yeah and then the guy didn't go anywhere and so dave escalated and he you know flipped his flipped his safety off and he fired two warning shots over the hood and the guy s- didn't move he stayed there and i was like all right you know and i just i just opened up on the car and uh it was it was kind of interesting because on nods with um, belted tracer or belted, you know, our, our 50 cal belts had like armor piercing incendiary tracer, Rafis, you know, and several other rounds, you know, on there, it was like, kind of like a laser light show hitting this, hitting this car. I mean, it was just blowing up all over the place. And then he turned, then he turned away, turned away from us. And, uh, I put a couple more, you know, into his, uh, in his back windshield and it killed him and he crashed into a wall. And so, um, at that point, some of our guys came out to see what the commotion was and, um, they came down and, uh, they were checking this dude out and, uh, we were going to send, we were going to send EOD down to see if it was a V bid. And so our EOD guys walked down the road and, uh, he's probably about 150 yards down the road now. And, uh, they were like, yeah. They got up to the car. They were like, this looks super sketchy. We don't want to mess with this. And so they just, they took a thermite grenade, threw it inside the car. And, you know, that thing went up real, real quick and started torching and ended up blowing up. But yeah, that was, for me, that was an interesting night because I got to see, you know, that sometimes you just have to make you just have to make a decision and it's not, it's not black and white. You know, it's like if that, if that guy, he was out past curfew, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't get out of there when we shot a visible laser at him. He didn't get out of there when we shot warning shots at him, you know, and, uh, and he was rolling around blacked out. They did take pictures of him. The, uh, the guys that went down to search the car and what they found was they came back and they showed, they showed the Iraqi um, army guys that we were working with who verified that he was a colonel, a former colonel in the Bath Army, and that he was, you know, now what we would consider an insurgent. Yeah. And so, you know, that was just a, it was an interesting, like I said, you know, a couple months later or a couple months before that, just graduating SQT to having to make decisions like that where it's like, I don't know, uh, you know, this could go, this could go either way, but, uh, you know, I want to be proactive and, you know, um, I, 
I, I later had a boss, you know, who told, who told me to err on the side of violence in war. That's what he told me. And Can you say who that was? What's that? Can you say who that was? Um, you know, I think he's still, I think he's still yeah. in, so I don't, I don't want to say, yeah. you know, who it is, but he, it was a guy who was respected and he's from, he's, re, he's from here in Texas, really good officer. Nice. But yeah, that, you know, and I hate to, I'm not even a violent guy at all. Like, well, I, you know, I don't, you, you'll never see me like out in town start starting shit or anything like that. It's just not, it's not my nature. But when you're in those situations where it's like, it's either it's either you or you or him possibly and we're not talking about a guy that's got an AK47 on you you know we're talking about a guy that's in a vehicle you know that could clack this i mean he could have he could have easily had a couple hundred pounds of C4 in there and if he would have clacked that thing off we would have been vaporized yeah you know so you know to me the the important thing with that um that that's much more on the the macro scale, the big big picture, thirty thousand foot view. That I think everybody needs to realize. Most, especially our uh, elected, I, I don't even like. I don't want to use the word leadership. Our our elected officials, we'll call them. Um, you know, is that that is the the majority of the reality of the situations that that unfold over there. Is that you know yeah. you're making split second decisions where you know multiple or many people's lives are on the line um there's not always a right answer sometimes it's the lesser of two evils a lot of times it is right. you know and and so to me what what that should further do is, is just like we were talking about earlier with accountability you know is that our job as war fighters is to do exactly that you know is to is to go to the, to the places that our elected officials tell us to go and say, you know, overthrow this government or take this fucking country, you know, whatever it is. And, and there needs to be a level of autonomy that, that is awarded our war fighters to, to do it how they see fit. Now, granted, that doesn't mean go full Viking and be a, a fucking barbarian, savage, right. you know, Russians circa 1980 Afghanistan where, where you're just being a brutal asshole but it does mean that you know you you err on the side of violence. You err on the side of of keeping you and and your brothers in arms safe to the best of your ability. And sometimes those decisions have to be made so fast that you don't get all the information that everybody else gets after the fact. But I think what it further highlights is the importance of, from a foreign policy big picture standpoint, is that you don't send us places unless you're okay with us doing that. Right. You know, like if 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 it's such a fragile condition. Uh, diplomatically to where we're not allowed to do what we need to do to come home, then don't fuck us. Don't fucking send us over there. Right. You, you know, I mean, to me, it, it really should be that simple is that, you know, if, um, you know, if, if you want us to, to cat and mouse and fiddle fart around or whatever, then you, you can do that, you know, through, through cables and wires and, and, you know, your, your diplomatic channels and, and whatever. But if it, if negotiations fail and it comes to, to the fist fight, then, then that's how it goes. I mean, to me, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times, but to me, I, I don't see on the largest scale possible where it's foreign policy and, and nations fighting each other or on the very smallest scale possible, a one-on-one, man-on-man street fight, is, is that the principles of, of that are all the same, is that you avoid it at all costs. You know, sometimes it can't be avoided. And, and the negotiations on, on both of those levels and everything in between uh, you know, the, the intent usually is to avoid the, the, the conflict, the combat, you know, but should it come to that, you know, I know if I get in a street fight and I'm sure you're the same way, like there, there aren't any rules that I'm going to play by if somebody's trying to, to attack me and my family, right. you, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to take the gloves off and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, stagger the deck in my favor to the best of my ability. I'll, I'll cheat fucking, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to be as advantageous as possible, to to minimize the risk to me and my family to defeat whoever's trying to fuck with us Uh, and i think that's how it has to be but it should also make it that much more critical for those decisions to be made ahead of time and and that you you avoid sending us there unless you're willing to let us do it that way that's my take on it yeah no i agree with you and it i mean they say they say that uh that war is awful and nasty for a reason i mean it, it it just is yeah, there, there's no good side to it. I mean, uh, you know, the Civil War, as an example, uh, you know, Tecumseh Sherman, 
for for you know some people may may consider it faults you know for all all fa- faults that he may or, or may not have had uh he was very effective you know uh, as as a union commander uh you know most specifically the uh the Atlanta uh you know, combat action that, that his unit saw while, while he was in charge of it. I mean, that was basically his, his mantra with every battle that he and his men fought, uh, you know, was that I want to make this so ungodly awful for the other side that they don't want to fight us anymore, you know, and, and that's as barbaric as it sounds is actually the most humane way to fight a war because it makes it the shortest Right. You know, the, the fewest amount of pe- people suffer for the shortest amount of time if, if you do it that way. You know, yes, it's still very brutal, uh, but to me, that that's just how it should be. And I and it, it really pains me that that we've got such bureaucracy ridden, um, just idiotic fucking people that that uh, are, are at the upper echelons of our government that have have not retained that lesson from from years ago from you know 200 almost 200 fucking years ago so um it's just uh you know to me it drives me nuts but um so once you left that uh that deployment you went back home um did you do a full workup then to to before the next one how how was that now that you'd been to war and and uh you know kind of almost did it backwards yeah yeah it was uh it was interesting because i got home and then uh, a couple days later, um, I was going to go on a date night with my wife. Like I'd been gone for three months. And uh, it was wild because a couple of my new guy buddies that were in Iraq with me were like, Eli, you've got to get back to Coronado. Because I had left. I didn't even, hadn't even put it, been put in a platoon, to my knowledge, at that point. You know, it was just doing, um, you know, that your normal activity activities around SEAL Team 3 until you get put into a platoon, like making sure like I was vaccinated or had this administrative pay, paperwork, paperwork done or whatever. And I remember what, a couple of guys started texting me after I drove home from Coronado to or to Point Loma and they were like, hey, you got to get back here, dude. Um, we're in, we're at Danny's right now. And, <laughs> and, uh, Christ, we're in, a black hole. we're in, we're in, you know, we've get, we've got put into, uh, Chris Kyle's platoon and they're demanding that you get, get back here. And I was like, Oh, this is not going to go well. And so I had to tell, tell my wife, Hey, you know, that day night with the, we were going to go on. Yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. And so, um, so you got laid that night, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I went down there and, uh, you know, it was a definitely, uh, like I talked about culture and platoons, it was definitely a different culture. And, um, you know, it was one of those, it was one of those coach, Hey, you're still a new guy. You didn't do a complete workup. I don't, we don't care. And you're going to, you're going to pay <laughs> the banker. You're going to pay the man for the next couple of years. And, and we, you know, and you know, that, that night kicked it all off and yeah. it was going to, that's how it was going to be. Yeah. Full speed ahead. Yep. W- were things ultimately, uh, during that workup, obviously they're different on the platoon side, but with the wife, were they rocky or, or was it, you know, just more like nuisance. It was, it was kind of rocky because now, you know, you're now in addition to, you're still, even though I'd gone to war, like I still knew about Jack squat. And so I'm still, I'm trying to still trying to learn all this stuff. Um, I was thrown into the ordnance department. So, you know, keeping track of a SEAL teams, you know, weaponry and, optics and suppressors and machine guns and rockets and ammo i mean that that's a big undertaking all of its own especially kind of when you're the new guy who's you know doing a lot of the heavy lifting on on that stuff and um also to throw you know even more stress into the mix we had uh we had our first child right during that workup oh wow yeah and so um you know, was, was dealing with that. And it was funny because, you know, Chris was pretty cool. Chris was really cool about family. Like, you know, he was really big on family. And I remember him always getting in trouble for sending us home early. And he would always, <laughs> he'd, he would always be like, you know, if, if you're not going to be doing anything, you're not going to be doing any, nothing here. You yeah. know, you guys all go home and he would stay there and he would just take the ass chewing and he'd be like, 
you'd be like, yeah, no, I'm not having my guys do that. They're gone all the time. I don't really care if that's what, what the team's what. <laughs> and so that was one thing I loved about him. And one thing he taught, you know, I learned from him as a leader is just like, take care of the boys, yeah. take care of the boys. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Don't be a ticket puncher. Don't try and, you know, you know, um, appease the brass, take care of the boys. And that was something that always impressed me about him. And so, um, even though we were gone all the time and, you know, when we were home, I did have a newborn that was actually sleeping in our room at the time. So it made sleep kind of difficult and just everything that goes with that relationally with your spouse. Um, you know, it was just one of the things that you got to, you got to Charlie, Mike, you got to deal with. And in many ways I'm grateful for, cause you know, I think the, like that whole saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it was just, um, you know, another opportunity for me to grow personally. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. No doubt. Um, did you go through sniper school, uh, during that, uh, that workup? So great question. Again, story number two failure. <laughs> How much time we got today? Mike? You got all fucking day. Um, I, uh, I started, um, in a stubby sniper school during that. And I was surprised cause mo- often, you know, at least up until that point, it was, I think, pretty rare for new guys to get to go to sniper school. Yeah. And so one of the things that uh, we did when we joined that platoon was we sat down with Chris and he asked us, what are your goals? What do you want to do in the teams? And I, the number one thing I wanted to do was be a sniper. And I remember him just like sizing me up. And, <laughs> yeah, you, is that right? You want to be a sniper, huh? And uh, he... Uh, <clears throat> He actually sent me like I was the only guy, the only new guy that got to go. And uh, again, um, NSW Sniper School starts off with pick, which is two weeks long and where you just learn how to like take pictures and like upload that data into like a laptop and then send it back, you know, to the talk or the higher ups so they can see what you're looking at. And then uh, from there you go to scout, which is like four you know, four weeks long and I was, you know, going through scout and, um, right at the end of scout, you have to qualify, um, expert with the, uh, M4 iron sights at like a, on a two at 200 yards. And it's actually, it doesn't sound crazy, but it's actually a really tough test because it's, you shoot standing, um, kneeling and prone. And it's timed and every shot counts and you have to get a certain score. And I ended up failing, even though I passed um, scout, I failed that qual. So I didn't get to go on to the third part of sniper school, which is actually sniper school in Atterbury, Indiana, which is where it was. And I don't know if it still is, but. um, And so that was really hard because I had Chris, you know, gave me the opportunity to go to that school and I failed him. You know, I failed the entire platoon because that was one dude that didn't get a sniper suite that couldn't. And that was the slot that they used. And, exactly. Yeah. And so that was another, you know, oh, crap. You know, this is not good, you know. So Chris wasn't, you know, Chris wasn't happy about that and rightfully so. And, I mean, he wasn't like he, you know, held it over my head every second. But, um, yeah, that, that sucked letting him down, you know, because, you know, even when I got – even when I got to the SEAL teams, I mean, there were a lot of rumors about Chris, you know, and who he was and, you know, what his reputation was. I mean, it, you know, it was it was good there. You know, I mean, guys called him the legend there, you know, and I was like, oh, God, that's not the guy you want to let down. And so um, anyway, um, didn't get that qual, had to come had to come back. And then uh, we started started into our workup. Yeah. So. Did you get a, an opportunity to go back? I did. Yeah. The very next, the very next pump came back to Delta platoon and they didn't make me go through pick or scout. I, all I had to do was qual, do that expert qual. And then I got to, uh, go to sniper school. And yeah. So you, you did the full workup of deployment and then you got to go in the second, the next time. Mm-hmm. How was that, uh, that middle deployment? It was interesting because, um, I felt like we were just all over the country. Like we were, we were looking hard for work and towards the end of it, many of our guys got into, you know, a pretty, 
like a pretty, I would say, epic battle um, for Solder City. So we started um, in Al Qaim, right on the uh, Iraqi Syrian border, and we turned over with an SF unit, and uh, they were living out of a train station, and they had like these portable, like big, big, big old tents that they were living out of. And we turned over with them and we had a couple CBs with us and we decided our head shed decided that we were going to build a plywood two story structure. So <laughs> two story. We, that's yeah, dude, brilliant. it was crazy. We spent the first <laughs> month of that deployment. We called ourselves seal bees. Like, and <laughs> one of my buddies shot himself in the hand with the nail gun. He was ground, he was grounded <laughs> off of power tools for a while, but, um, it was, it was interesting because we were just, you know, building our own rooms. And I remember like, you know, cause it, it's so hot over there. AC is everything and like insulating it, insulation is everything. So we had like this spray foam that we'd spray in the cracks to keep our rooms cool if the AC was working. And I remember the room just smelling like the, <laughs> the foam, like the, the fumes of the foam were sometimes overpowering, but so we did that. And then we, we started going on a lot of desert patrols. And um, we were looking for foreign fighters and uh, weapons that were being smuggled in from Syria to Iraq. So we did a lot of desert patrols. And then uh, we ended up at one point in the deployment, we flew our Humvees up to Mosul. And uh, we took our, you know, then we were doing more patrols up there. And then towards the end of, uh, towards the end of that deployment, and we, we were going to Rawa, Hit, Haditha, all over the place. And then um, and then towards the end of it, what they did was uh, kind of the way I understand the story is that um, the army decided they finally wanted to take Sadr City. Was that during the surge? Yeah. yeah. They wanted to cordon off Sadr, Sadr City so that they, they could control what went in and what, what went out. And so they built these massive T walls around it and they used Iraqi contractors to do it. And while they were building the T walls, Al Sadr's militia was just smoking these dudes. And so the army decided, all right, um, let's, uh, you know, let, let's deal with this issue. So they, they, they rung us up cause they knew we had sniper teams in country. And so some of our snipers and, uh, JTACs and then RG33 technicians and drivers were the guys that got to were the guys that got to go. I didn't get to go. I didn't get to go with the first group. Um, actually, when Chris came back, because Chris they sent Chris over there, and that was like his that was like his final hurrah in the SEAL teams before he retired or got out. And uh, when they when he came back to our base they actually sent me over obviously not as a replacement because i'm not definitely not replacing chris but um yeah so i got to be there for i think a month and a half before they shut down they called it nsw debt defender how uh, how were those operations um so they were pretty crazy um initially like i was told that um i was told that the roes when they first started were like the wild west man just like you know it was open season and uh our guys were doing some serious serious work and killing a lot of a lot of people but you got to keep in mind that before that even happened i mean you know the the bill or the u.s military was putting out word hey get if you're if you're an innocent civilian get out of this area because this is about to get rowdy and yeah. so they, I, th I know that they did everything they could to like mitigate collateral damage. Yeah. Were the, the operations pretty cut and dry, uh, in terms of what you were doing? Sniper overwatch is basically protecting these construction crews. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yeah. I think that's what, I think that's what they, uh, they started out, you know, being, I, when I got there towards the end, I remember, you know, doing, doing several sniper overwatches. Um, but once I got there, I didn't see a lot of T walls being built. I remember, um, one, one big threat at the time was they, the insurgents there, they, uh, they had these bongo trucks and they had these, like, they look like acetylene tanks, 
and they were launching those into fobs as like missiles. And so that was one of the one of the jobs to be on the lookout and you know take those out if you saw them. Were, you know. were there numerous instances where you did? Um, there weren't numerous instances where I was on an op and we did. I'm just saying that was one of the things yeah. that you know we were we were looking at because that was one of the big weapons that they were using that was actually inflicting pretty good casualties on yeah. U.S. forces and civilian force yeah. civilian population. During those those operations during that deployment or at all during that deployment, did you get to do some? actual sniper work and, and pulling the trigger i didn't because that was the set that was the sec that was my second deployment and that that was a deployment where prior i had failed sniper school so oh, yeah. it wasn't until i got back i got to go to sniper school then we went to fallujah on my third and final deployment and by the time um we got over there and i finally had my sniper qual they weren't letting snipers do any work they were trying to de Christ. I know they were trying to de-escalate things and snipers don't typically do that. Yeah. So Well, if they're good enough, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good point. Um, if, you, but, if you use them enough and effectively enough, they can de-escalate the whole fucking thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, I never got to, you know, operate in that capacity, but yeah. it is what it is. The uh when you finished, or I guess during that second deployment, um were, were there uh significant operations that your entire group did uh, during the Sadr City uh, surge stuff? Yeah, so what they did was they took guys from SEAL Team 3 and guys from SEAL Team 8, and they formed what they called Super Troop. And we are operating out of Biop, Baghdad International Airport. And they said it was one of – we were staying in, like, one of Uday or um, – Yeah, one of, one of the, Saddam's sons, you know, one of their former residents. It was a pretty nice place, and it, you know, was overlooking a big pond. Um, and, uh, you know, so we would we would roll out pretty heavy because we were rolling into some pretty, you know, violent areas. We would usually have like four or five gun trucks with our WS's remote weapon systems, and then, uh, which is the remote control 50 cal. And then we, you know, we would roll in, dismount, you know, take whatever building we were going to watch. Sometimes we'd go in at day, most of the time we'd go in at night and we'd just, you know, we'd just kind of sit there. But after those guys, the guys that were there before I was there, they did so much work in that area and they just took a hammer, you know, to Al Sadr's militia. Um, I think it was one of those, you know, instances where a lot of the guys fighting against us decided, Hey, this This isn't worth it. This isn't worth it. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, when you came back from that deployment, you did another full workup before the third. Yep. At that point, did you kind of finally feel like you had your feet wet and you weren't a fucking new guy? And finally, yeah, finally the first time where you really kind of, and even then, you know, even then there was still a lot that, um, you know, I still didn't know, but I finally felt like, okay, I'm, kind of getting the hang of this. I finally feel like I'm adding some real value because by, by my third deployment, I was, you know, sharing responsibilities as point man, lead navigator, lead sniper, and, you know, lead ordinance rep. So yeah. I had a lot, you know, a lot that I was, you know, dealing with. And I finally felt like, okay, this, I feel finally feel like I'm an asset to this yeah. group. With all three platoons, were there, how would you describe the leadership was, were all three of them, you know how it should be or did you have any leadership failures from your perspective looking back on it oh, I, I mean i know nobody's perfect but you know like i know that uh, i've certainly seen you know some good and some bad um yeah i think that i definitely saw some leadership failures and i think i definitely saw some solid leadership as well you know um you know some and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna mention any names yeah. but uh we you know I did see, I did see leadership that, uh, you know, definitely would, I mean, there's, there's having, there's having a good time and then there's being completely inappropriate and, you know, and actually like losing the confidence of your guys. And I saw that happen, you know, on more than one occasion. And, uh, that's always, that's always hard to watch because it's like, oh man, don't, don't you understand what you're doing, man? You got to you got to turn around and tell these guys what to do tomorrow, and you're acting like a complete like clown fucking partying or what? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's weird. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate. I guess it's not weird, but um, yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. It, 
I think, you know, I've, I've never been in that position. So, you know, I, I can't, can't speak from experience in terms of leading men into combat, but, um, but yeah, I, I can see, I can certainly see where, where the, the pressure and stress from that, uh, you know, could, could get to you to the point where yeah. like, you know, it's, it's gotta, you gotta have a blow off valve somewhere, yeah. you know, and, and I don't envy that position that that's a tough, tough spot to be in for sure. But, um, I'm assuming the first one for sure was no. The second one, maybe third one, possibly. Did you uh, incorporate canines into any of your your operations? Yeah, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I remember going on. I remember going on one op. I think it was. I think it was my second deployment where we took some marine dogs with us, and one of, one of them was a German Shepherd. And I remember I was driving that night, and I was on the security element, and so. I remember my, my job was just to like hold security that night. And I remember hearing over comms that the dog jumped off the roof. No like, shit. Yeah. The dog, Jesus. you know, they sent the, they sent the dog in and you know, he was doing his, he was working, doing his thing. And I think he fell. Like, I don't think he saw something. I don't know how it happened, but like he really hurt himself, like dislocated his back or his hip or something. And the handler, you know, just loving his dog wanted to send in a meta meta back to, and and uh they they denied it because the air was red and we actually it took us three hours to drive to that location that we hit that night because it got um because the skies got so fouled it took us six hours to drive back and you know so i remember remember uh that that poor dog you know he's in pain for a, a good amount of time but i also remember um you know I was always impressed, like watching those dogs, like with the titanium grills yeah, and just, you know, um, hearing guys, uh, you know, talk about, you know, their, um, their ability to be good interrogators, yeah. you know, and just like add value in that, in that regard was, uh, was interesting, but we, yeah, we took them, we took them with us, uh, pretty regularly. Yeah. Do you know, did that German shepherd that got hurt, did he survive? He, I don't know because he, uh, he was kind of like a loner for that night. Yeah. I, we couldn't get an NSW dog. So, um, I think the dog we were working with a lot at that point was a dog named Cairo. Did you ever? Oh yeah. Cairo. With uh, Lloyd as his handler. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, and so because we couldn't get him, the couple, couple Marines that we would sometimes, um, that would come help us out on ops. They, they offered up their dog. And so we took him. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It's, it sucks on the, on the injury thing. I mean, the one thing I'm sure he had, uh, pain management fucking meds with him. I mean, you know, they pretty much all do. So I, I hopefully he wasn't in, in too much pain for too long, but that's one of the, the really unfortunate, um, side effects. Um, you know, especially early on now, I mean, the, the medevac platforms are, are pretty paralleled with dogs and, and humans. I mean, I, had countless guys on of, of you know tell, telling stories of their dogs getting getting wounded that you know got life flighted out and you know medevac to germany and then to lackland and, and right. you know full recovery and they got treated just like a human some sometimes you know in that case even if it had been a human maybe they wouldn't have been able to medevac at them either you know I, I, right. I don't know but um but one of the unfortunate realities is, is stuff like that is you know the depth perception or vision's different you know falling off of a roof or or just getting injured, you know, the one stark contrast between dogs and humans is that they don't really understand being injured the way we do, you know, um, to them, it's just, it's adding to stress and chaos and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, some of them can make them panic a little bit and that's a tough spot to be in. But were there any, uh, ops that you went on where the dogs actually, uh, did some good work that you can share? I think just, um, I don't think there was any, like, I think, you know, just like, you know, grabbing squirters, stuff like that, or, um, you know, you know, discovering something that, you know, we were looking for in the house. I think that was like contraband, stuff like that. But I don't think, you know, I was never on an op where, you know, a dog alerted us to, you know, some guy that was getting ready to ambush us or anything like that. Yeah. The, uh, the squirter stuff, any of them stuck out? Oh, man. Yeah, I think one time on my second, 
on my second um, deployment, we had a uh, we had a squirter on an op, just a guy trying to trying to run out of there, and uh, they released the dog, you know, and he he tracked him down, had him hemmed up pretty good, yeah. and then you know <laughs> he got a, he got a ride back with us to get checked out for who he, who he was, why he was running. Yeah. Do. Any, any idea what panned out? No, no, I didn't. Do you remember seeing where the dog bit him? Did he fuck him up? Yeah, I think he I think he bit him on the leg. Yeah. To me, it's, it's always fascinating, and I think to a lot of people, of how much damage those fucking dogs do in, in such a short amount of time when they're the real deal. You know, they, I mean, it's, it's fucking impressive, no doubt. But uh, do you have any dogs now? Oh, my God, Mike, you would. <laughs> it's that bad, huh? You'd probably kick me out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have two daughters, and um, they have a Pomeranian, mm. so. Yeah. I mean, I you know, to me, I don't judge, right? Number yeah. one. Number two is that I legitimately love all dogs. You know, yeah. I mean, like uh, one of my kids has a uh, has a fucking golden doodle. So there you have it. There you go. Um, you know, to me, I, I appreciate all dogs for what they are. I also realize that most of them aren't on the caliber cognition, trainability, um, in, internal uh, or intestinal fortitude and backbone you know most dogs aren't on the level of the dogs that, that we've worked with and and that I still deal with uh, you know pretty regularly but I also don't discount or um, scoff at uh, how important of a role so many dogs play in so many people's lives from a companionship yeah. and mental health standpoint I mean it's a huge uh, aspect to, to dogs and, and really all animals. And so I, I love respect and appreciate all dogs. I, I really do. You know, um, I don't, you know, I, I may joke here and there about, you know, the scrap of hair that barks that, you know, is like a cat that barks or, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but in, in all seriousness, no, I, I, I fucking love all dogs, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons, but um, yeah. And it was on that note, it was cool because we actually held off on buying a dog for a long time. And then, me and my wife just with business and kids like we didn't want another responsibility um and we wanted if we did get a dog we wanted to take care of, make sure we took good care of it and so we actually it, it actually worked out great because it was during we just got it last year during coat when COVID yeah. kicked off so it was phenomenal for my kids like yeah. they love <laughs> yeah. they love this dog and you know that that was my goal it wasn't to go get the dog that like would be my best friend but yeah. it, to get the dog that you know they were gonna they were gonna love would be pretty easy to take care of and a matter of fact like two or three years ago i was down here in texas for the chris Kyle memorial benefit and uh wayne chris's dad was going to take care of me and, and get me a really awesome belgian Malinois that had been trained by but one of SEAL Team Six's handlers, oh, no and the dog's name, of course, was Breacher. And yeah. I was like, "Dude, <laughs> this is this is some match made in heaven." And so I was like, um, "But then I did some research on the dog, and I was like, dude, you got to run these things.' Like, it, stuff I was reading said you got to run them like five miles a day or something crazy." And I was just like, "You know, I I, I don't have a you know I live on a hill." Like, I don't have, like, a, you know, backyard or anything. And, you know, it just wouldn't be a really conducive. It wouldn't be good for, I don't think it'd be good for the dog. Yeah. I mean, you know, with, with that, you know, breed is a, is a great starting point, but it's generic also. You know, the domesticated dog, unless generations and generations are being bred for specific work, work which I, I'm assuming that this one was, but... Um, but not always, uh, or, or should I say, you know, out of a litter of eight, even if the parents are fucking pipe hitters, not all eight of them are going to be that way. No different than, you know, I've got two older brothers that are vastly different than me. You know, your yeah. two brothers sound like they're, you know, similarities, but there's some differences. It's the same shit there. Even when you're selectively breeding, uh, they don't all turn out that way. You know, I, I source a lot of dogs for personal protection for uh, high net worth clients that, um, most times I'm actually looking for the dog that's not that so high strung, so high drive to where, you know, if you're not putting two hours of fucking dragging their dick through the ground every day, then they're going to chew the couch in half. Like, right. That's the dog I'm looking for. And then they are out there, you know, and, yeah. and I wouldn't say that there are a ton of them, uh, but they do exist, you know, and, and there is that happy medium. But, uh, but anyway, I, I still, I, I would agree in that, like, unless, 
you want to use a dog for the purpose that it's been bred for, right. it's, it's probably better that you don't don't have that. But well, I probably should have probably should have given you a hauler. But you know, and that that was another thing that I was because I do travel a good amount, yeah. and I wanted, you know, sure. I wanted like some, you know, uh, another deterrent, another yeah. another thing to help protect my family when I'm not around. But. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean it's uh it's all it's all kind of relative and and uh, like I said, it, I think so many people say like, oh, Dalmatians are this or you know Malinois are that or fucking Labs are this and and again like that's a good starting point, but you you can't discount and you, you have to I I hold far more value in in the parents, you know the the previous four generations or thirty two immediate ancestors what the litter is like, uh, you know, how, how the puppy or dog, uh, looks when I, when I evaluate them from, from a puppy standpoint or, or whatever age they are and putting them in different positions and seeing how they are, that, that carries far more weight for me than what, what their breed is. But, um, all right. So that third deployment, it sounds like you're just kind of chasing fucking geese, uh, looking for work and not, not getting much or. Yeah. The third deployment, um, was, not a ton of work, you know, just because uh, this we were turning 2010. 2010, so yeah. we were starting to try and turn everything over to the Iraqi army, um, and so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a ton of work, but it was still it was still decent. And in the role that I was operating in, you know, I you know got a lot of good experience. I felt like yeah. Um, what, and, what was the primary uh, aspect of that? You know, it was interesting on that. Um, we were still we were still doing you know DAs here and there. We were definitely doing some FID with the Fallujah SWAT team, and you know trying to train those guys up. But one of the our main missions on that deployment was to actually try and find uh, Major Troy Gilbert, who was a one of the only missing um, service members in you know the the U.S. at that time, and. They thought they were pretty confident that he was dead. He was, you know, an F-16 pilot that had got, you know, was working and trying to bail out, I think, some SF guys in a t pretty big tick and um, got shot down. And uh, because of uh, how much blood they found in the cockpit and, you know, um, some of his some of his remains, they were pretty sure he was dead, but they wanted to recover his body. And so we actually, they embedded an SF guy with us, a former SF guy. I think he was a former SF guy. And he was, his sole job was to find, um, you know, guys that were MIA. And so we, we actually uh, did a lot of work. I think we went on like 15 ops trying to recover him. And wow. Any luck? No. Well, he ended up, he ended up getting recovered like, I think two years ago. Wow. And it was wild because I got to meet his wife and his kids. He had like four or five kids. Holy shit. Yeah. And they were all super young. And I got, his wife is one of the sweetest people I've ever met, um, Ginger. And I got to meet their, their sons and his daughters. And just, uh, you know, we, you know, I got to share with them some of the video footage of us looking for their dad. Cause I just, you know, it's always cool to see that, um, you know, I know people tell, tell them all the time hey you know we're trying to find it. but hey i got to show them video footage of us digging up you know concrete slabs looking for their dad and i yeah. i think that you know i hope it meant something for them. sure it did there's yeah I, I have no doubt what what other type of stuff did you do in terms of of uh searching for him oh man we so we offered rewards we offered some pretty hefty rewards for i i want to say I want to say it was like half a million dollars or something like that, which is a lot of money over there. Yeah. And uh, um, we, we, we dug up a lot of grave sites because we would, you know, we had our own ASO guys, our own guys that were developing intelligence. And so when, when uh, information that the U S is, you know, going to hand out a payday like that to anybody that helps you find somebody, you get a lot of, you know, information flooding in. Yeah. And so we went on a lot of, you know, a lot of ops that, you know, didn't end up panning out anything. But um, I did think it was cool that, you know, being a family man myself and wanting to know that people would would look for me if like I, I 
so I could come home and have a proper proper burial. It did feel kind of cool to be a part of trying to bring home a service member yeah. to his family. You know, oh, that's fucking really cool. Do you know how uh, subsequently of having had him been found, how close you guys were? Do you know? So um, one of uh, my swim buddy and buds, the second time he was the OIC of that deployment, and he's now he's he's now a commanding officer at one of the seal teams on the mm -hmm. west coast and uh he was telling me it was it, we were right on top of him you know because he i i spoke to him a afterwards about it and i think one of the you know i think some of the information came from one of the shakes that we were working with at the time but yeah i guess we were we were right in the ballpark yeah do you know where they ended up finding him I don't. I'd have to go. I'd have to go look it up or make yeah. some phone calls. But I guess I'm, I'm just curious what kind of what the, if, if there's any circumstances that that were uncovered. Like I think I think I was told, but I'm kind of a knucklehead, and you know, I just I think I kind of spaced the details of it. But I do remember the sentiment being, "Hey, we were really close," and you know, to me, all I cared about, you know, was like, "Oh, sweet, he got to come home." And it was kind of crazy because I think that was like the second or third ceremony for the family to go through, you know, yeah, cause wow. one, when he gets shot down and we're pretty sure he's, you know, deceased. And then, um, you know, I know that that was another ceremony. Hey, we're, we're bringing home his remains and now you're going to bury him, you know? So, you know, I'm sure it was kind of a bittersweet thing for the family. Yeah, no, no doubt. You finish that deployment up, you come home. At, at what point did you uh, realize slash decide that you wanted to get out and, and move on? I actually decided on my final deployment in 2010 that I was probably done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it was a combination of several things uh, from injuries to, you know, having uh, a young child and watching her grow up in pictures, basically. Um and then also just kind of seeing, feeling like in a way I'd done what I came to do, like post 9-11, wanted to serve. That was my fifth deployment. Um, and I think a lot of operators get to the point where you deploy, you come back, you almost do in a lot of cases the same work up. You deploy, you come back, you do, and it becomes kind of monotonous. Not, I don't want to say monotonous, but kind of like Groundhog routine. Day routine, you know. And so I needed something new. And so I started thinking, I'm either going to get out or I, I got to go. I got to go down a different pathway. And start, so I started looking into like uh, our, uh, you know, level two, level three programs, stuff like that. Because I felt like that'd be a new challenge for me and, you know, might seg segue me into whatever I was going to do when I got out and. You know, I started, I actually re-enlisted on my deployment in 2010 because at the time you could re-enlist and you could give your GI Bill to your kids. And I also knew that like with a family, I wasn't ready. Like I, I didn't have enough preparation to, I, I didn't feel like get out successfully and provide well enough for them. So I wanted to give myself enough time for like to plan an exit strategy. And so I re-enlisted in 2010 was going to, I knew I was bound for shore duty and I was going to do everything I could to prepare myself for exit. And I wanted to be able to give my kids the opportunity to, you know, at least go to uh, some community college before I had to, you know, if they didn't get scholarships or whatever, but. So what was the remainder of, of your time spent doing? Was it the level programs or was no, it no. So, um, one of my one of my platoon chiefs um, who ended up becoming a master chief um, he uh, he went to a command called the recruiting directorate I don't know if you ever heard of it the NSW recruiting directorate yeah. which is kind of a it's kind of odd because we don't we don't recruit seals you raise awareness about the SEAL teams, but you can't talk a guy into coming because if you have to talk somebody into coming and they get hit with that, yeah. you're going to be like, no. You almost have to do the opposite. You almost have to try and talk guys out of it. Yeah. And if they I still come. you have what it takes. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the sure. guy you want. The guy yeah. says, oh, really? Yeah, motherfucker. Okay, what? roger that. Yeah. No, was, I'm about uh, to show you. Was Mike Mike with you in that, uh, in that program? Who? Uh, Mike Mike. 
I mean, you, you know him. I no, don't no, want to no, say no. his last name, but no. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Um, so what what I did, and the reason I the the reason I went over there wasn't because I was like, oh yeah, man, I want to go recruit the the guy that I worked for my second platoon. He was running that shop, and he said, hey Eli, if you come over here and work for me, I'll let you go to college in the afternoon. Oh, nice. And so. I was like, okay, yeah, because I'm, I'm planning on transitioning out anyway. So I went, did that, and um, it was interesting, you know, just kind of seeing the operation and, the, you know, the teams from a different side of things and, like, learning things that I didn't know, like big picture things as far as when I came in, the NSW was only filling up 60% of their seats. Like a lot of, a lot of seats and a lot of spots at Bud's were going unfilled just cause they didn't have enough, uh, students showing up. And then when I was in that shop and I think a lot of it had to do with media and culture, um, and guys that were coming back from wars and movies that were being made and stuff like that. And more, it was kind of probably like the top gun effect where people, young kids were like, Hey, this looks like a pretty cool deal. And so they were showing up. And when I was there, it went from being, when I joined 60% of our seats only were filled to like, you could be the greatest candidate ever an Olympian coming off the streets. But best case scenario was if you say, Hey, I'm in today, you're not going to show up till nine months later. Yeah. So, you know, you saw a flood coming in and it was also interesting just watching how NSW was trying to improve their product in that before I got there, they did a Gallup survey to find out, you know, and I think the Navy spent a good amount of money on this this survey, trying to figure out who was making it through, who wasn't making it through, interview them, and compile a bunch of analytics on them. And what they found is one of the underlying or uniting you know themes was that there were young men coming out of, I think it was seven different sports that were doing noticeably better in SEAL training. And I think number one was water polo, two was swimming, three was wrestling, four was like cross country or crew or lacrosse or something, but they were all, I noticed they were all sports where you like, you couldn't hide in your position. Yeah. You know, like in, like when I grew up, I played football and I was a quarterback. So they put a red Jersey on me and they're like, don't hit that kid. You're not getting, you're not getting hammered. You know, if you got a little red Jersey on you, you know, or a lineman, you know, it's like, Hey, your job is to be big and strong you know, your job is to push people around, but we're not going to expect you to do wind sprints, right? In these other sports, you had to be able to do everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we we would go around the country to like wrestling tournaments, water polo tournaments, swimming tournaments, et cetera. We would put kids through a Navy SEAL um, screen test. And then we would, sometimes we'd show a video if we had audio visual um, capability and then we'd be like, all right, hey, you know, here's some more information if you guys want to learn more about it. And we, we wouldn't take down any names or anything like that. And we would just, it was just an awareness piece. And one of the other things that we were doing, this is how I caught the entrepreneurial bug while I was there. Um, the USOC, the U.S. Olympic Committee has a, uh, a training facility in Fallujah, or not Fallujah. <laughs> yeah, in, in That's Fallujah. dangerous and hard. Um, <laughs> what's that little what's that little suburb of uh, San Diego where they have that training center? Oh, Chula yeah. Vista. Yeah. No. Nah. Anyway, it's yeah, it's, it's it's out there in that in that um, area out east. And um, so they what they were doing is they were they formed a relationship with NSW and they were sending some of their athletes down to get a little bit of training. And so I think one of the first one, one of the first groups that went out there before I was even there was like Michael Phelps and a couple of their high profile athletes that were down at Chula Vista USOC training facility and wanted to get a little bit of mental toughness, train like a seal day. And these guys just got hammered. They got destroyed. And so um, word got back that these guys had just got to go do this. And so a bunch of USOC's teams started asking, Hey, can we come down and train with you guys? And so that, you know, that partnership kind of grew and USOC would occasionally send, you know, their, their guys down. And it was that department that would, you know, have them do log PT, 
you know, and it was, I guess, a patriotic kind of cool thing. Like, Hey, you know, we want you guys to succeed in the Olympics and it's, it's a good like media PR thing for us to. So what ended up spinning off of that was, um, the, I guess the green Bay Packers called, <clears throat> Um, the office and was like, Hey, we're, we heard you guys are working out the USOC and, you know, folks, would you guys do a workout with us? And so from what I've been told, the uh, request went up the chain of command, like, Hey, the green Bay Packers want to come work out here. Can we do that? And I guess the Admiral's like, no, there's no return on the investment. No like shit. we're here to raise awareness for the next, you know, nobody's going to le- leave the Packers making league minimum, like 450 K to come join up and be a seal. And so, um, that that got squashed. But what happened was um, in, in that moment, some of the guys in the shops were like, well, clearly there's a need for this. So let's start up a business. And so they started started up like a side hustle. You know, it was called Acumen Performance Group. And they asked me to, you know, come be a partner in it. And so I was like the seventh guy brought on or something. Um, and it was, that's when I caught the entrepreneurial bug because like, I just remember being excited about the company, what we were doing. I believed in what we were doing, but I also loved the challenge and I loved that the upside was, you know, infinite. Like we could blow this up into whatever we wanted, depending on how well we did and how well we structured it. And so that's when I, you know, that was the first, um, business that I was a part of starting up and, uh. And it definitely led to some of our successes at Bottle Reach. So I'm assuming you're not still a part of that. No, um, I actually uh, there was there was a point after Bottle Breacher, you know, after we 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 started it, and then we went on the show, the Shark Tank, and you know that did really well. But I I had to focus all my attention on Bottle Breacher, and I didn't feel like it was fair that yeah. like I was you know I was a part equal owner in this thing and. Um, so I, I just gave my shares back to the, the company cause I wanted to see those guys succeed and, you know, and they, I, they, they're working with like, you know, Super Bowl teams. I saw them, you know, with the Niners, you yeah. know, at Super Bowl a couple of years ago, they've worked with the Falcons and it's really cool. Like one, of, I think the last gig I ever did with them was I, they flew me out to uh, Fort Lauderdale and I actually got to lead this workout, but I think it was me and like 10 other SEALs. And uh, we worked out the Miami Dolphins on the beach there. It was freaking cool, man. Yeah. Log PT, everything. And I'm watching guys that I watch on TV, like Adama and Sue, like yeah. the nastiest man in the NFL. Yeah. Like I'm watching him do log PT. And I'm like, this is crazy, man. Yeah. How cool is this? So I'm, I'm curious with that, right? Is that uh, at that level, right? <laughs> there's a lot of those guys that i don't know any of them admittedly so this is you know maybe it's a a biased or unfair perception but it seems like and you hear enough of the grumblings of like the Deion sanders mentality of like i'll do what i feel like doing and i'm not going to risk getting hurt or fuck you like you know you're not going to fire me i make this this company too much money whatever was there any of that attitude with any of them like i'm not fucking doing this fuck you like don't you know you don't talk to me like that i make fucking you know two million dollars a game you can fucking blow me like was there any of that you know we never saw we never while i was there i never saw any of that really to that extent i think you i definitely you know saw some attitudes like why are we doing this i need to be you know one of the first pro gigs that we got was working with the pittsburgh pirates like some of their uh um, you know, minor league teams. And that was a risk for the organization to bring us in from a liability standpoint, because you got to keep in mind, these guys have agents and, you know, they have a player, you know, play players, uh, union. union and all of this stuff. And so, um, it was difficult just to get, you know, just to get our foot in the door, but, you do see a lot of that. And one of the things I noticed, cause I was always trying to break down, okay, what are the differences between the SEAL teams and these teams, right? From the, from foundation to, you know, the, from the individuals to the organizations. And one of the things you notice, especially in America, like we put such a value on sp- sports and athletes, like it's just an American thing. And I think, I don't think it's just America. I think depending on the sport. Yeah, it's Europe kind of and soccer is that way. Global thing, Crazy. right? And it's like once a young man or young woman shows talent in one of these things, it's almost like they get a protective bubble put around them. Like, hey, yeah. don't don't piss off Mike, man. Yeah. They, that guy throws a wicked fastball. He, he sure as fuck does. Let me tell you what. Right, <laughs> right. So, you know, 
that was one of the things that, you know, we tried to, you know, bring into their culture. It's like, um, you know, and, and you can, I think you can only do so much, but even if you can move the organization one or two percentage points, sometimes that's the difference between, yeah. you know, going home before the playoffs and making the playoffs or going deep into the playoffs and not. And so that was one of the things that was a tough, you know, definitely a, a challenge was to, cause it, you know, the deal in seal training, you show up, nobody cares who you are. Yeah. Nobody cares what family you come from, what color you are. It's like you, you do what, you do what this is the standard you will meet it or you we will send you packing and we won't think twice about it the other thing with that too is 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 that there's zero fucking wiggle room for attitude from from the students oh yeah i mean less than zero right like if it's even perceived that you're thinking about getting attitude you're you're gonna have your ass handed to you yeah whereas with these guys like it's not like you, you know, you can't take and Dominic and Sue out on the beach and beat him until he quits. He's going to be like, fuck you. Yeah. You know, so that, that's, I've always had that question because I've known some other guys in Acumen and I've seen other guys do stuff like that, whether it's corporate events or, or whatever over the years. And, and always kind of wondered like, how the fuck do you handle that? I mean, cause at the end of the day, like you, you can't make them do it and, and their coach isn't going to fire them if they tell you to fuck off and walk off, you know? So, right you know that that to me that that's the the one kind of potential missing link of any of that working is they've got to to buy into it if they don't then it's like fucking useless like the guys that that volunteer to do it and 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 go all in are probably the guys that don't need that anyway you know yeah and and so i think it's a combination because i never did see you know working you know working with the highest levels you know um i these after I left, they, you know, it was kind of a slow, slow burn buildup, but they were working with the Miami Heat. Um, you know, I know they worked with NHL teams, multiple NFL teams. And uh, I think it's a combination of there has to be buy in from the organizational level because at yeah. the head office level, if there's not, it won't matter. Yeah. But that's one of the things I noticed is that most of the groups that were s- successful in kind of like changing and adapting their culture they had buy-in at the head off at the uh, front office where like, Hey, yeah. we want to, we want to win and we want to, we'll do whatever. And the other thing too, is that like, you can tell, like, it's almost like you got, you got two elite teams. Like they have a lot, even though these guys make millions of dollars, they know who the seals are, you yeah. know? And, and so they, when they see a group of team guys come in, you know, to uh you know, to their organization, most of them will at least give you the time of day to, hear what you have to say and like you could, not, you could tell there was like a level of respect there like yeah. okay they're not looking at you like you're a group of reporters just fucking annoying them exactly yeah well, that's cool yeah that's refreshing to hear for sure um bottle breacher yeah a couple things i'm curious about where did the idea come from and i and i 100 percent, i know everybody's going to want to hear about the shark tank experience and, and what what it's represented on TV, how it actually happens, how it all works behind the scenes, that kind of stuff. If you could kind of walk us through for, first where the idea came from and how, how it all spawned and then get into that. Yeah. So my little brother, the, uh, the Cobra, pilot. Cobra pilot in the Marine Corps, he, uh, he went on a deployment to the PI, the Philippines, and he was like one at one of these outdoor markets and they had 50 cal bottle openers and he picked me up one. And he brought it home and gave it to me. I was just blown away by how cool this thing was, right? I mean, it's like 50 cows. It's like almost the perfect size for a bottle opener, you know, just naturally. And uh, to be honest, most guys have never held a 50 cal in their hand. They just haven't, you know? And so I got this thing and I was like, man, this is cool. And just have, you know, the guys over to the house, you know, to uh, have beers, watch a UFC, whatever. And I'd break that thing out and they'd go bananas. They were like, dude, this is the coolest thing, man. Where can I get one? I was always like, I don't know, man. My brother got it in the <laughs> Philippines. And so a couple years later, I was actually driving. I'd gone up to L.A. from San Diego to L.A. for some of my family met up there for Thanksgiving. And I was driving back and I just kind of had this epiphany moment. I'm like, you know, I think it's freaking sweet. What if I made it better? And I got home that night and I had some spray paint and I took this thing and I spray painted it black. And then I had... Um, I'd made some platoon, um, DVDs of our last platoon de- deployment and I bought some Punisher stickers cause that was our unit logo. Um, it, 
uh, Delta Platoon and SEAL Team 3. And so I, I bought some little stickers to put on the DVDs that I handed to each guy. And um, it came with some little ones. So I took the little one. I put it right on the, the 50 cal bottle opener. And I took it to work with me the next day. And the guys were like, are you serious? Dude? This is the coolest <laughs> thing I've ever seen, dude. And then they started placing orders with me. I didn't even have a business. Yeah. Like I was just like I made something that I thought would be cool. Yeah. And they were started like, hey, man, I'm going to need seven of these for every guy in my family for Christmas. And that's when the light bulb went on because, you know, the deal, Mike, it's like with team guys, man, everybody wants you wearing their glasses. Yeah. Everybody wants you wearing their, you know, if you can get a product into the SEAL teams and then market yeah. it as, hey, it's the yeah, watch it's of the, the SEAL team, yeah. the sunglasses of the SEAL teams, yeah. you know, you're that's a really good marketing position. And so if these guys who get a lot of stuff handed to them for free and in my opinion are probably some of the coolest guys, if not the coolest guys in the world are wanting to buy your, this thing that's not even a company yet off you. There's something there. You For just sure. have to figure out, okay, now how do I take this and spin it into something that's, you know, not just this little pool of guys. Yeah. But I was like, if these guys would want this, everybody yeah. would want it. And I just have to figure out how to market it to them. Yeah. So without trying to get into the logistics and the quote unquote secret sauce of your business, I, I've always been curious, where the fuck do you source that amount of spent brass from? Yeah. So there's a couple places you can actually buy inert 50 cal online. And obviously like anything else, the more that you buy, the better deal you get. Um, like when I started this out, I would buy 10 at a time yeah. and I would, you know, just, I started with a Dremel tool. I would cut into them with a Dremel tool <laughs> and they look like crap, man. But like I figured out how to do it. And, uh, my first, the way I would measure it is I'd take a tape measuring cloth and I would like measure how long the cut needed to be and how long the tooth needed to be. And I would like take a tape measuring cloth. And it took me, I timed myself. It took me seven minutes to draw you know, exactly what Pretty. my outline was supposed to be. And then I'd take my, I'd put it in the bias. I'd take my Dremel tool and I'd be, you know, do a bunch of cuts on it. And they look like kind of crappy. So it's only like 30 minutes a piece. Yeah. Even when I got good at it and then, you know, they still, I love collecting the first, the generation one, cause they still sold. I, yeah. I made the first like 500 of them <clears throat> with the Dremel tool and some spray paint and some stickers yeah. and people were still buying them cause it was that cool of a product at the time. And then, you know, I just was like, once I saw like that there was a definitely desire for this product and there was kind of a little bit of a magic behind it, I was like, I started focusing on trying to make it better and better and better. And then I went, <clears throat> found a machinist that could help me put a professional cut in there. And then I found a powder coater that could, instead of spray painting, that's going to chip off, that could, you know, put a professional coat on there. And then, you know, and then Jen and I, my wife, um, she had an online business which is what gave me the confidence that I thought, I thought I could make some cool stuff, but I knew I couldn't sell it. And, uh, I was like, Hey babe, do you think you could help me, um, put these online? And she's like, uh, yeah, let me do some research. And she comes back and she's like, Hey, let's put these on Etsy. And I was like, Etsy, what, what is that? <laughs> and she's like, she's like, it's like an artisan's eBay. And I'm like, that sounds kind of really i don't know that's not the market i think i want to sell this to and she's like no trust me she's like the the women that shop here will buy for their guys yeah. and she was 100 percent right and so um we listed them on etsy and i you know even though they looked kind of crummy at the time i started always start high right so i started the msrp the price high and then no nobody was biting it's just like fishing okay change the lure let me drop the price a little bit Dropped it down a little bit, got a couple bites, and then I dropped it down one more time, found the magic, you know, magic number. And then, you know, people just boom, 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 boom all, all the time. And then uh, Jen and I, um, we had two small kids. She had a business. I was the LPO of uh, NSW Group One uh, trade at Marops. So I was, uh, my job was to like make sure that like two platoons of SEALs at a time so like 40 to 50 shooters coming through were being taught how to like take down a ship on the west coast which was a you know really difficult like it was a logistically it was a tough job because you had like you know you had um you know the ribs that we use the s you know sbt guys use um you had the whalers the safety boats you had role players you had you know naval ships the Atlas that we did a lot of EBSS on, you had live breach scenes, you had simunition, 
sometimes you'd have dogs, you had helos that would come do. I mean, it was a logistical um, fucking nightmare. It was. And yeah. that was the thing that prepared me more than anything to run a business. Cause yeah. I was like, I learned real quick that in it, when things get that chaotic, there's so much out of it that you can't control. So instead of, you know, just like, oh my God, this is the plan. Everything has to, you just like, okay, this is what, th these are the things that have to happen. And when they don't happen, these are my contingency plans. This is how I flex. This is how we're going to keep this ball moving in the right direction. And so that's kind of where I learned, you know, I feel like I got my best training on, you know, how to, you know, survive in, in the business world. But, um, Anyway, um, we started, we started selling online and then, uh, you know, things quickly started escalating. And I remember, I remember at about six months into it, my initial goal was to make $500 a month, just supplemental income, you know, to buy a gun or like date night or throw some in savings and within some only fans. I mean, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, six months later we were doing $7,500 a month and I was oh. like blown away. I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, at that time, we were watching Shark Tank. Even though we didn't let ourselves watch a lot of TV, that was the one show that we would take a break, like maybe, you know, what, eat our dinner or two or something. And we watched Shark Tank. And I remember Kevin O'Leary was ripping apart an entrepreneur on the show because he had no brand recognition on his product once it left the package, like no name. And so I was like, I was like, babe, we got to figure out how to get bottle breacher on each and every one of these. And so I started doing some research and I found laser engraving and I was like, okay, this looks like it could do it. I don't know if it could do it, but it looks like it could. And so I started doing some research on used engravers, found that there was one about two hours down, you know, the road from me in LA. So I drove up there, took a look at this unit and the guy was a laser engraver distributor. So he, you know, showed me all the toots and whistles, what this thing's capabilities were. I actually took some of the 50 caliber brass that I was working with up and he did some tests and I was like, yeah, I think this would work. I think we could, you know, brand every bottle breacher that leaves um, the shop. And at the time I had a little bit of residual reenlistment bonus left over. I had about 30 grand in the bank. That was like our family nest egg. And this thing was like 10 or $11,000. I can't remember exactly. And I was like, you know, I really don't want to risk any of my, you know, our family's nest egg on some, an unknown something. I don't even know really if it's going to work or not because it's used, it's old, but I think it could work. And so what I did was I took, I had a badass like big dog chopper motorcycle and it was uh, just San Diego is a great place to ride. And this thing was like my therapy. So I was like, you know what, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell that bike I'm going to take that money and I'm going to buy this laser engraver. And that's what I did. It was almost like a perfect swap and bought it, came, brought it down, had a friend show me how to hook it up. We played around with it, started branding every bottle breacher that left the shop. And then we started, you know, getting uh, orders to personalize and put um, like groomsmen gift names on the back, like, you know, groomsmen, father of the bride, what, you know, whatever it was and sales went from $7,500 a month to $22,000 a month in just a month and a half. And I was just like, Whoa, that, that really surprised me. Cause I was just going, my, the main focus was to get the brand on there. Yeah. So you bought another bike, right? I did. Yeah. yeah years later, yeah. probably, you know, a couple of years later I bought another bike, but it was just cool because that was my first, Hey, like wake up call lightning bolt. Hey, buy assets. Learn how to buy assets, things that are going to make you more money. Because most of us, from the time we're this big, we get taught to buy liabilities, mm -hmm. right? Buy shoes, buy, buy clothes. Shit that you want. Yeah, buy this, yeah. buy this phone. You know, things that you know end up usually costing you money. Yeah. You know, and and um, that was my first lesson with buy something that's going to make you money. Yeah. And so I've been. I don't always get it right, but I try and buy assets. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'll buy something I think is going to be an asset, and it ends up being yeah. an expensive yeah. doorstop. But I mean, so, sometimes I think you have to buy. You know, in, in the case you with with buying a bike years later, and I've done the same thing. I've got a couple couple of motorcycles and, and cars and stuff, and you know, to me there there has to be a trade off at some point. Like, or what's the fucking point? You right. Know? But a hundred percent. But that there's a absolutely a fine line business wise of. Um, 
you know, not just being like, oh, fuck, I got just enough to buy this. You know, I talk about it uh, on, on our other show uh, on Influence quite a bit about about how uh, there's a difference between being able to buy something and being able to afford something, you know, and, and people yeah. screw that up a lot of times. But right. uh, that, that's such a, a cool transition. At, at what point then, so now you're clearing 22K a month in revenue. Is, is that when you went on Shark Tank or, or how did that kind of come to fruition? Right. So it was... Um so that would have been like 2000, 2013, summer of 2013. By winter, Christmas of 2013, we were doing $30,000 a month. And then by summer of 2014, right before I'm getting ready to go on terminal leave, we're doing $80,000 a month out of that one car garage. And it was so crazy, dude. I had like five or six part-time employees in there like the and it was a one-car garage God like damn. it was so small <laughs> like i had i had to have like a portable honda efi generator because we yeah. didn't have enough power <laughs> i had a, I had a polishing wheel i had like three computers in there four laser engravers in there and we tripped the power all the time God, and it was crazy because i was still doing my navy job so i would come home from my navy job jen would tell me what the or he, she would have the orders printed out what i needed to make i would go into the garage state stay up you know way into the early hours of the morning making sure all the orders were done you know um until i got people to be in there all day while i was working you know and it was just it was just crazy you know i you know i think i gained like 15 pounds just you know just the stress and started losing my hair and yeah. like <laughs> but it was it was you know it was cool and uh and then uh that's eighty thousand dollars a month summer of 2014 is when I went and um, pitched to Shark Tank. How, how does that work or how did that work? Uh, like, is it just a cold call thing? Like you fill out a form online or how? You can do that. And the first time I did that, I got nowhere. I yeah. didn't even hear it, get an email back from them. But the second time I did an open casting call and uh, that's when uh, I actually got to uh, pitch to, uh, they call it a uh, casting director. And she loved it. She was like, she, they emailed me, you know, a couple of days later and like, hey, you, you're moving on to the next round. Now yeah. you have a week to make us a video talking about your company and showing us more. And so from that point, how long was it before you actually went on the show? From that point, it's probably like three months. Three months. Uh, when you actually went on it, is there any contrast from what it looks like on TV versus the actual process? Yeah. Um, like, uh, you, the, you know, when you see guys walk, I don't know if you ever watch oh, the yeah. show, but you see the, the entrepreneurs walking down the hallway and, the, and that music's playing. There's no music playing, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so just and, fucking... and you get in there and it's kind of wild because they had, they tell you to walk out to a mark on the floor, like some tape on the floor. You stand there <clears> and they <throat> cameras and the sharks are all sitting there just eyeballing you. And these cameras are like rotating all around, getting like a, all these sweeping shots of you and stuff like that. I think you probably stand there for like two, three minutes while, and just stare at each other and, <laughs> and then it's game on. That's a fucking trip, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I suppose for a lot of people that, uh, you know, there, there's something about going to combat and, and just being in the SEAL teams that, that makes all, pretty much everything else seem like not a big deal, uh, which is one of the, the best takeaways that I think yeah. any of us probably get from, from doing that for a living. But for some people, you know, they're not comfortable public speaking or, you know, or just not not that confident, you know, in terms of social situations that are unknown that way. That that could be fucking intimidating, I, I would imagine, for big, some people. Yeah, big time. It was funny because we were in the green room before we, we went out there and my wife, you know, she was just like pacing around like she was forgetting where <laughs> she went to high school. And she was like, she's like, Eli, I need you to get fired up. Like, and I'm just like, I'm like laying on the couch, you know, like hurry up and wait. Yeah. I'm like, you're babe. asleep. I'm like, babe, trust me when it's time to go, I'll get up. I'll do my thing. Yeah. And, uh, it was just, uh, it was wild because we were actually in the tank for like an hour and 20 minutes and uh, you only see like eight or nine of it on TV. But, um, the other thing that they make you sign a bunch of paperwork, basically saying we can make this show look any way we want it to. And they, they had one of the sharks in our episode on TV going out of the deal that didn't actually go out of the deal. So Really? Yeah. That's weird. Well, yeah, it builds a little bit of but other than that, man, it was really it was a really good portrayal of what actually yeah. went down. 
I, I haven't seen your specific episode on purpose because um, I, I didn't. I, I didn't see it, you know, when it came out, but I didn't want to watch it before talking to you to, to know kind of what happened. What what did end up happening? So, you know, how we learned in the teams, one is none, two is one. Yeah. You know, redundancy always, always. You know, have a backup plan, and so one of the things I was thinking about is like, all right, I want two sharks in case one is a dud or one doesn't close or whatever. And so, uh, you know, I went in there targeting Mark Cuban cause we run an online business and he's the tech guru. So I was like, he could probably help us with our online business. And the one thing I didn't contingency plan for prepare for or even rehearse was Kevin O'Leary making an offer. Cause he's called, his name is Mr. Wonderful on the TV show. He's the bald guy. Yeah. He's a, kind of like the jerk guy on TV, yeah. but he's actually wicked cool. I love that guy. And so do all the entrepreneurs that work with him, but he made the first offer and that kind of threw me, threw me off a little bit. If you watch the episode, you can see me kind of like the, the, <laughs> the squirrels, the hamsters running around and they're like, Oh, what do I do? Should I, should I take his offer? And so we, uh, we got to deal with Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary. They both own 10% of the company still. And what, uh, what were the terms? Cause they, I mean, they say what they are on TV, right? It's not. Yeah. So you have to get, you have to get what you ask for. Right. So, um, if you ask for like, we asked for $150,000 and we, uh, for 10% equity in the company. So that's a $1.5 million valuation, which was pretty lenient con considering what we were doing at the time. Um, and they actually devalued the company. Um, and they, they, they came in, they offered us $150,000, two sharks. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they each got 10%. So we lost 20% equity. We got the 150 K, but we got two sharks. And the way I looked at it was I've seen a lot of people go on that show, whether I, you know, did it right or not. The way I looked at it was I'm not as concerned about you know, particular, the, what, what necessarily the terms are. I want to get out of here with a deal and I want, what I really want is tactical partners. Yeah. I want guys that can, you know, kind of guide us, direct us and open doors that I probably couldn't get into on my own. And yeah. so, you know, we, we got, you know, two of the biggest sharks on our side and, you know, we definitely learned a lot along the way. So is that, if you don't mind my asking, if you don't want to answer, it's certainly uh, okay. Uh, do you still have that deal with them? Yeah. And and so they're still 20% partners in it? They are. And, and how has that gone? Like, I've always been curious, because to me, similarly, like, if I was to try to go on that show, and it sounds like you're in the same position, it, for me, it's not about needing that that capital investment. It's about the relationship with those people, and, and more importantly, the people that they know and and. Uh, you know, I'd rather give, I'd rather own 80% of tens of millions of dollars than a hundred percent of half a million, you know? And so ha have they kind of pulled through uh, the way that you hoped uh, in that manner? So, um, yes and no. Um, but you, you really hammered something for any of the entrepreneurs out there. Mike said something that's so important. I like to say that, you know, 30% of something is more worth more than a hundred percent of nothing. And mm -hmm. that's one that's one massive uh, mistake that I see a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs make. They try and hold on to everything and yeah. they try to keep creative control and like they don't, you know, they never bring on any partners and they, they own 100% of nothing is what they do. Um, and so um, I would say I've been really, really impressed with, you know, Kevin and just his devotion to his companies. And it's like, you got to be realistic. I think expectation management is one of the most important things you can go into anything with, with Kevin. He, uh, you know, he owns probably, you know, hundreds uh, of companies, right? I, mean, I don't even know. He probably owns like 40 or 50 shark tank companies. And yeah. then I don't, I'm sh I know he does a bunch on the side, you know, as well. He's, he's a big time investor. You know, I know he does, I think he's got like uh, television deals with ABC and, you know, a bunch of other companies. And so, plus he's also a family man. So, you know, it's like you put all that together and it's like, how much time does this, does this guy have to devote to this $75,000 that he invested in your company? Right. Yeah. Cause like any investor, you want your money to work for you. You don't yeah. want to work for your money. And so just understanding that and being realistic about it, you know, after the fact really helped me realize, okay, you know, we're not going to get, 
you know, the amount of help that I would have loved or that anybody would have loved. They're not going to come in here and be like, yeah, all right, I'm bringing these five guys in. We're going to like fix her up for this business. And like, you you guys will be good to go. But they were always there like, hey, what, Kevin, what do you think about this situation? What do you think we should do? Do you have anybody we can call on, on, on this over here? And they've always been good about answering questions, making connections, et cetera. But um, it was, it, you, they definitely weren't going to run your business for you. You still had to run it. Yeah. No, I, and to me, that's really how it should be is that if they do, then you don't really learn anything and agreed. Like I've certainly had people, uh, you know, approach me about investing in certain things and, and whatever. And that's always my take is like, you know, I don't, I don't mind contributing certain components here or there, but I, I don't have the time to dedicate to, you know, to anything other than that. Like, you right. know, I'll put some money into it, but you're not going to get more than, than a, an opinion here or there or whatever. Like that's, that's for you to do, you know? And, and so I, I totally fucking get that. And I agree again, I think, you know, if, if they came in and just did everything, like if I was going to do that, I'd want 90% of your shit, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I, not, you know, not for, for 10, 10 fucking percent of something. I'm not going to put that kind of work in, especially at, at that level monetarily, I think. But right. uh, can you disclose or do you care to disclose how, how it's grown since they can't come on board? Like, yeah. So it went from like, uh, it went from like, um, you know, probably, probably like a million dollars in sales total before to over probably 21 million after so i mean it's it's still a small business you know but i mean it definitely grew quite a bit and um you know it's like it's another one of those things too is like you learn in business is like if you don't keep invent reinventing yourself if you don't keep adding new content or new product you're gonna go away sooner or later and that's yeah. been one of the things that uh, along with just continuing to you know um keep a solid team around you is keep new product. Cause once people, the shark tank is a double edged sword. You have 12 million people that just saw your product and they go out and it's like, boom, it's like a lightning bolt of sales and mm -hmm. it's phenomenal. But the downside is that all your competitors and everybody and their brother that can get into that business is now questioning, should I do it? Mm -hmm. And if I'm already, if I'm, if I already have the infrastructure in the team, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try and take market share away from these guys. And so, yeah. you know, um, there were def, we definitely saw a lot of that people coming out with, you know, similar stuff, even trying to call it the same thing and, you know, dealing with some of those, dealing with some of those issues. But the other thing too, is it's, you know, uh, products like the, these, I think will always have a place, but they definitely have like a, uh, a lifespan if you yeah, will sure. of like hey it's rocks it's super super hot right now but it's not it probably won't always be so yeah. what's the next thing yeah and so that that's where you get to be creative and you know try and be tactical yeah and, and since then you guys have, have brought several other, other different really cool products to uh, to the market you care to talk about some of them yeah i mean if you think that grenades that open your beer are cool <laughs> i mean i do but i don't know who wouldn't <laughs> right we call it the freedom frag you know no big deal but yeah we've come up with wine openers um you know keychains the coasters, uh, too, right? the coasters yeah. are badass the uh we, we have combat coasters that have like bullets and brass and i'm like they have like six hour expanded hollow points in them. Uh, we just came out with some new ones called the war coasters that are completely transparent. Those are cool. You know, just a ton of barware, like whiskey bullets. Um, you know, we, one of the products we developed was a, uh, ammo can that, uh, was a six pack carrier. It's called the <laughs> combat cooler. It was super expensive to manufacture, but it was really just yeah. really cool. And, yeah. and so many products that we've developed develop that's one of the things that i'm most most proud about is never letting it you know just always coming up with something new yeah no it's that's a, a really good and important point because I, yeah i mean that that wave of um of exposure does not last long you know i, I experienced a similar thing when 60 minutes did a, a thing on me back this was back in april of 2013 and, and for that few months afterwards yeah it was just like dude i couldn't get out of my own fucking way right with requests for you know media appearances or book signings or, or fucking whatever and uh and it was awesome and then all of a sudden it was like you were that um you know two years out of high school going back to the high school football game like guys hey right. like right i'm still cool right right it's like nobody gave a fuck you know it's yeah, like yeah, yeah you know you were 
you were the cat's ass for a few minutes and then now yeah. like it's on to the next fucking thing you know and so right. uh I, yeah I, I totally totally get that um of course looking back I, I wish i had all all of the products and online training and shit that i have now back then uh but you know that's that's again it's just one of those lessons learned but um where is the headquarters at and and what uh, how, how is that all situated in terms of like, do you have your own manufacturing plan and all that shit now? Or Yeah. So we've, we've tried to keep it pretty lean. Um, uh, we've got, um, <clears throat> the headquarters is in Tucson, Arizona. We've got three in incubator spaces. One is set up to do powder coating. We do, we have like two spray booths, our own 14 foot oven, and we do all of our powder coating out of that facility. Then we have one that does machining where we have like a CNC mill that does like cuts all of our bullets, all of our freedom frags and stuff like that. Um, and then we have the, uh, a, the actual main office, which, you know, has, a I think eight or nine laser engravers in it that does all of our, <coughs> all of our personalization. And then we've got, um, you know, a bunch of admin folks in there. And then, um, you know, our guys that, you know, do the, uh, polishing packaging, et cetera. Yeah. That's fucking cool, man. I, uh, I'm baffled that you don't have any of the products here sitting on the fucking desk. I know, man. I gotta, I gotta bring you some. This was yeah. kind of like a last minute deal because yeah. uh, I'm such a knucklehead. That <laughs> every time it's, it seems like every time I go somewhere, I'm like, who do I know in Texas? And you and I were supposed to do a podcast last year, but I kind of, kind of screwed it up. And I thought that I could, it was going to be like a phone thing or yeah. something, and I should have known better. And then you were like, no, well, man, it's actually in studio. And yeah. I'm like, no, I mean, that's, that's pretty common. I mean, mo most people, especially over the last year, you know, almost nobody does in-person shit and I only do in-person shit. I mean, to me, like, I like that better. Yeah. yeah. I, I would rather do no episodes a month or one or two. You know, I, I do them when, when I, when my schedule and the guest schedule allows and it makes sense and they're willing to do it. And, and to me, just the, the, the quality of interview is, is just not even comparable, you know, right. to, to doing a fucking zoom call or something. It's just not the same, you it's know? Not. And, uh, and I, and I, I stand by that. I mean, I've, I've had some very big name people agree to, to come on, but only via zoom. And I'm, and, you know, tell, telling people that, that everybody knows who the fuck they are. Like, no, thanks, but no, thanks. If you're not willing to come here, I'm not interested in doing it. Uh, yeah. kind of sucks, but, but I, I stand by it. I just, I'm just not going to do over the phone bullshit, you know, but I love it. Um, but, uh, no, it's really cool. I'm surprised also that you live so close to where you grew up uh, in terms of it being just a hot, miserable fucking mess, but I know, Tucson, huh? I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably 10 degrees cooler than Yuma, but it yeah. still gets warm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, my, fun. my wife's family's from there. So, you know, yeah. I was like, Hey, she's traveled all yeah. over the place no. following me and you know holding down the fort and i th yeah. I know she wants to get back to her family so yeah. that's what we did oh, that's good that's good shit uh all right so now still running bottle breacher is your main gig uh but you're doing the sig uh, sig shooting how, how did that what what do you do for them brand ambassador wise and and how did that pan out right because of the bottle breacher relationship i'm assuming it yeah that that definitely had <clears throat> a that definitely had a lot to do with it um so that's actually how I got to come out and do your show is I'm actually in town that we were doing, uh, we were doing like a little video on, uh, invasive species and, uh, we were doing some helo hunting and some hunting last night and just some hog hunting and predator hunting. Yeah. And, uh, I know that the SIG team is talking to a professor at A&M today about invasive species and how much damage they do and stuff like that. But it started when I had a, uh, publicist probably about five or six years ago and eh, maybe not that far maybe four or five years ago and her whole, whole job was to get me like tv spots so that i could promote the company bottle breacher and uh she uh she was like hey do you want to go meet the guys at six hour and i was like six hour hell yeah because yeah. you know i didn't really know what sig was it i just knew that we carried them in the pistol the 226 and the seal teams and i was like that's a pretty good pistol because yeah. I was the platoon ordinance rep, so my job was to know which guns worked, which didn't, if something's broke, how do you fix it, you know, et cetera. And I didn't, I think one time I had an issue with a 226 and it was something with the barrel. We had to send the barrel back and get a replacement. And I would, did that job for four years. And so I was just like, yeah, dude, I really like that product. So I said, yes, I'd love to go meet him. And so she set up the meeting and I went, you know, went out there and I thought before there were a couple of emails exchanged between myself and SIG. And originally what we talked about was maybe getting bottle breachers on the six hour website. 
And so they're like, yeah, you know, that shouldn't be too big of a deal. We like your company. We like, like who you are. And so just come out and we'll, we'll meet and we'll have, you know, talk about it. So I flew out there and it was funny because my wife, you know, she was always like, you know, she's always holding down the fort when yeah. I go do whatever. And so she's like, Hey, are you sure this is worth your time? And I'm like, babe, I don't know, but you know how I am. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go see if it, see if it is worth my time. Sometimes yeah. it is a lot of times it's not, but I went, I got there and like the whole marketing team was in a room and wow. I walk in there with my, the public, my publicist at the time and, you know, sit down really professional, um, you know, and it just the conversation was really, really good. And towards the end of the, the meeting, um, they were like, hey, you know, the bottle breach on the website, that's not going to be a problem, but there might be a, more of a chance, a better opportunity to do some more if you're interested. And I'm like, absolutely, because what I didn't know about SIG and I learned on that day was I got to I got to briefly talk to the CEO, Ron Cohen, who took that company like 17, 18 years ago from being bought for a dollar to now being like the 800 pound gorilla in the room in, yeah. the, in the firearm space. And, uh, and he's, a, he's an Israeli, uh, former Israeli soldier, and he's also uh, an engineer. So like just a real cool combo of, uh, <clears throat> that, that, that makes, that kind of drives SIG. Yeah. But um, he, um, so I got to tour the factory and I, I didn't know that SIG was made in the USA. And that's why she, my publicist knew them because she was repping John Ratzenberger, who uh, made Cliff America. Clavin yeah. made America. And so he would go out there and speak, you know, to their employees. And, uh, and so I got to tour the factory and I was blown away, man. I mean, if you ever, have you ever gone to SIG? Mm -hmm. Dude, it's, it's insane. It's like, uh, I think they have like 2,500 employees, robots everywhere. Like you could eat off the floor in there. It's so oh. stupid clean. And I got to see that not only was SIG, uh, you know, did they have handguns like I knew about, but they had carbines and SBRs and they had suppressors and they had optics and they had their own ammo. And I was just like, I couldn't believe that how much they'd expanded into that. And nobody really, not a lot of people at that time really knew. Yeah. And a lot of people still don't, yeah. but it's, uh, it, it, I was just so blown away by, you know, how much was going on there, but the professionalism that I... At that point, um, I was like emailing their chief marketing officer like every yeah. two weeks, like, "Hey, <coughs> Tom, you let me on this team. I want to, I want to play on this team." And so, after hounding him for I don't know, maybe like four or five months, he finally, you know, gave me like a, a like a six month contract. Let's see how this works <laughs> out. And then, you know, he, you know, he's been extending it ever since. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really fucking cool, man. And, yeah. and I think another another example of resiliency right is no you know fucking i think so so many people uh entrepreneur or otherwise kind of have this uh, entitled or entitlement uh feeling in, in that like an opportunity is going to present itself to you you know and, and i can't stress enough like you have to make the opportunity not that it's not going to fall on your lap like yeah there are there are the occasions where that happens but those are anomalies and exceptions you know they're for fuck sure not the rule right uh you know and, and most of of people that you see that are successful have failed way more than they've been successful uh, and, and the common denominator is they just never fucking stop trying to kick kick doors open you know right and, uh, and that's what you have to do and, and you have to continue to do that you know but uh, it's a really interesting story to have. I, I can't thank you enough for uh, for coming on the show and and uh, sharing you know both your experience and the SEAL teams as well as the entrepreneur thing because I, I'm fascinated by it because it's the same same life I'm living. So I, mean, I could sit here and talk business and shop with you all fucking day. But um, in terms of of what your goals are for kind of moving forward, is it just continuing to do the the SIG stuff and, and bottle breacher? Do you have any other big plans moving forward, or is that that kind of it for now? Um, yeah, you know, I've got a, you, you were talking about, you, you were talking about opportunities, um, sometimes just present, presenting themselves. And I've got a pretty big opportunity in front of me right now. And, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to see, I've, because I, because I know this isn't going to air for a week, I don't mind, you know, mentioning it, but, uh, probably about three weeks ago, I was actually approached about running for congress no shit yeah i <laughs> do that's awesome yeah and it was it was something that you know, i really wasn't i make a lot of political videos yeah i'm seeing because them. you know for me like i 
I, I think that this country is going to be destroyed from, you know, within, and I think it's happening every day. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's hard for guys. I think it's hard for guys like you and me that are like, Hey, if it was my way, I would, you know, just every generation or two send a bunch of pipe hitters over, deal with the problem and then, you know, just keep America solid. But unfortunately it's, I think it's being destroyed from inside. And I think one of the reasons yeah. is, is because we don't have enough, uh, you know, evil times when good men do nothing. We don't have enough people that are like, I was willing to stand on principle. Yeah, there's not enough representation in in key roles by the right people. Right, you and know. so even though it's, I think it's a na probably the nastiest place on earth, and I don't want to expose my family to that. And honestly, I don't necessarily want to be around it. I don't want to walk away from this fight and look back and say, you know what, you could have done more. Yeah. And you know what, I don't want to look at my kids or your kids and be like, you know what, wish somebody would have stepped up and done something when if you have the opportunity whether i win or lose and it, if i decide even decide to do it whether i win or lose um i'll have a real tough time looking back and being like you had an opportunity you, you, didn't, you do didn't do anything it. about it yeah. don't bitch about it right yeah, yeah. i think that's fucking awesome man i uh yeah, yeah however i can support you to, in, in that endeavor just let me know because that's fucking really awesome no i appreciate that man yeah that's cool as shit i hope i uh, hope it pans out uh, anything else you want to add alibi wise? No, nah, man, just, you know, thanks dude. Yeah. Fucking a man. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's been great having you on. I uh, appreciate your story again. And, uh, it's all, all fascinating shit. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm assuming visit bottlebreacher.com. Yeah. Bottlebreacher.com. And then, um, the, per my personal is Eli Crane CEO. Okay. So there you have it. Uh, check out his products. I've, I've looked at a bunch of them. If, uh, if he had brought some, I'd be I'd set them on the desk and uh, we'd we'd finger fuck them on the show. But uh, I've I've seen seen them in person as as well as all over the internet. They're uh, they're they're really fucking cool products. So I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all-around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house, and they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now, and I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd like to take a second to uh, shout out our newest sponsor, which is Project Warpath. This is a Navy SEAL-owned company uh, that provides apparel with a pretty edgy uh, feel. And uh, it's a good friend of mine that, uh, that runs it out of California. Uh, and just a, overall a great outfit. Um, they've got a, a whole line of different shirts uh, one of which uh, is, is arguably arguably my favorite, which is Epstein didn't kill himself. Wonder where that one came from. And uh, but yeah, there's Hillary Clinton killed my friends. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, pretty edgy and cool patriotic sayings on T-shirts with uh, with good design, good high quality, uh, and it's one that uh, that I'm actually wearing right now. So uh, I appreciate uh, them sponsoring the show again. That's Project Warpath. Uh, you can get all their stuff online and, uh, and, you know, the shipping and customer service is top notch quality product and, uh, you're supporting a veteran owned business. So shout out to project Warpath, go check their uh, stuff out. I'd also like to say thank you to our other sponsor resilience premium CBD resilience is excited to offer all mic drop listeners, a 20% off discount on all products for two weeks from when this podcast is live using the discount code mic drop at checkout. That's two words, Mike drop at checkout. I'd also like to say that resilience is a great company uh, that works in conjunction with Trico CBD and all military veterans and first responders receive 35% off. Yes, that's 35% off for all military veterans and first responders. And that's uh, through the military and first responders program. You just have to sign up at resiliencecbd.com slash military first responders discount. Uh, in terms of about resilience, generally speaking, it's a premium CBD that I use. Again, it works in conjunction with the Tricos brand for the everyday athlete. Uh, that's www.resiliencecbd.com. And resilience was uh, really born with the founders who uh, are military veterans as well, 
personally experienced the effects uh, and impact that CBD had on their own mental and physical obstacles. Their focus was sharper, mental stress was calmed, fitness stamina increased, and their bodies felt less pain, inflammation after super intense workouts. Uh, a lot of times most people and, and people are able to either wean and off entirely or significantly reduce pain management, ther uh, pain management therapy. This is a shared vision among the founders that this uh, incredible supplement had not only changed their lives, but had the power to provide unbelievable benefits to family, friends, athletes, fellow veterans, and ultimately the entire fitness community. So big shout out to Resilience for their product as well as the Trico stuff. Uh, we sure appreciate their support. Um, thank you to all the guests. Appreciate uh, you guys tuning in week after week. Uh, because I haven't said it yet this episode and everybody's waiting for it, feel free to choke yourself. And uh, until next time, this is Mike Drop. <laughs>